Section 1 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea. July 1st. St. Gaul. Bishop. St. Gaul was born at Clermont in Avignon about the year 489. His father was of the first houses of that province, and his mother was descended from the family of Vettius Abagatus, the celebrated Roman who suffered at Lyon for the faith of Christ. They both took special care of the education of their son, and when he arrived at a proper age, proposed to have him married to the daughter of a respectable senator. The saint who had taken a resolution to consecrate himself to God withdrew privately from his father's house to the monastery of Cornon, near the city of Avignon, and earnestly prayed to be admitted there amongst the monks. And having soon after obtained the consent of his parents, he with joy renounced all worldly vanities to embrace religious poverty. Here his eminent virtues distinguished him in a particular manner, and recommended him to Quintianus, bishop of Avignon, who promoted him to holy orders. The bishop dying in 527, St. Gall was appointed to secede him, and in this new character his humility, charity, and zeal were conspicuous, above all his patience in bearing injuries. Being once struck on the head by a brutal man, he discovered not the least emotion of anger or resentment, and by this meekness disarmed the savage of his rage. At another time, Evaldius, who from a senator became a priest, having so far forgotten himself as to treat him in the most insulting manner, the saint, without making the least reply, arose meekly from his seat and went to visit the churches of the city. Evaldius was so touched by this conduct that he cast himself at the saint's feet in the middle of the street and asked his pardon. From this time they both lived on terms of the most cordial friendship. St. Gall was favored with the gift of miracles and died about the year 553. End of section 1section two of little pictorial lives of the saints by john gilmary shea this librivox recording is in the public domain july second the visitation of the blessed virgin the angel gabriel in the mystery of the annunciation informed the mother of god that her cousin elizabeth had miraculously conceived and was then pregnant with a son who was to be the precursor of the messiah the Blessed Virgin, out of humility, concealed the wonderful dignity to which she was raised by the incarnation of the Son of God in her womb, but, in the transport of her holy joy and gratitude, determined she would go to congratulate the mother of the Baptist. Mary therefore arose, saith St. Luke, and with haste went into the hilly country into the city of Judea, and entering there into the house of Zachar, saluted Elizabeth. What a blessing did the presence of the God-man bring to this house, the first which he honored in his humanity with his visit. But Mary is the instrument and means by which he imparts to it his divine benediction, to show us that she is a channel through which he delights to communicate to us his graces, and to encourage us to ask them of him through her intercession. At the voice of the Mother of God, but by the power and grace of her divine Son in her womb, elizabeth was filled with the holy spirit and the infant in her womb conceived so great a joy as to leap and exult at the same time elizabeth was filled with the holy ghost and by his infused light she understood the great mystery of the incarnation which god had wrought in mary whom humility prevented from disclosing it even to a saint and an intimate friend in raptures of astonishment elizabeth pronounced her blessed above all other women, and cried out, Whence is this to me that the mother of our Lord should come to me? Mary, hearing her own praise, sunk lower in the abyss of her nothingness, and in the transport of her humility, and melting into an ecstasy of love and gratitude, burst into that admirable canticle, the Magnificat. 
Mary stayed with her cousin almost three months, after which she returned to Nazareth. Reflection Whilst with the church we praise God for the mercies and wonders which he wrought in this mystery, we ought to apply ourselves to the imitation of the virtues of which Mary sets us as a perfect example. From her we ought particularly to learn the lessons by which we shall sanctify our visits and conversation, actions which are to so many Christians the sources of innumerable dangers and sins. End of section 2《セクション3 of Little Victoria Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. July 3rd. Saint Heliodorus, Bishop. This saint was born at Dalmatia, Saint Jerome's native country, and soon sought out that great doctor in order not only to follow his advice in matters relating to Christian perfection, but also to profit by his deep learning. The life of a recluse possessed peculiar attractions for him, but to enter a monastery it would be necessary to leave his spiritual master and director, and such a sacrifice he was not prepared to make. He remained in the world, though not of it, and following the example of the holy anchorites, passed his time in prayer and devout reading. He accompanied St. Jerome to the east, but the desire to revisit his native land and to see his parents once more drew him back to Dalmatia, although St. Jerome tried to persuade him to remain. He promised to return as soon as he had fulfilled the duty he owed his parents. In the meantime, finding his absence protracted, and fearing that the love of family and attachment to worldly things might lure him from his vocation, St. Jerome wrote him an earnest letter, exhorting him to break entirely with the world and to consecrate himself to the service of God. But the Lord, who disposes all things, had another mission for his servant. After the death of his mother, Heliodorus went to Italy, where he soon became noted for his eminent piety. He was made bishop of Alpino, and became one of the most distinguished prelates of an age fruitful in great men. He died about the year 290. End of section 3 Section 4 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. July 4th. St. Bertha, widow, abbess. Bertha was the daughter of Count Rigover and Ursana, related to one of the kings of Kent in England. In the twentieth year of her age, she was married to Siegfroy, by whom she had five daughters two of whom, Gertrude and Diotilla, are saints. After her husband's death, she put on the veil in the nunnery which she had built at Plangier in Artois, a little distance from Hesden. Her daughters, Gertrude and Diotilla, followed her example. She was persecuted by Roger, or Rotgar, who endeavored to asperse her with King Thierry III to revenge his being refused Gertrude in marriage. But this prince, convinced of the innocence of Bertha, then abbess over her nunnery, gave her a kind reception and took her under his protection. On her return to Plangi, Bertha finished her nunnery and caused three churches to be built, one in honor of St. Omer, another she called after St. Vast, and the third in honor of St. Martin of Tours, and then after establishing a regular observance in her community, she left St. Diotilla abbess in her stead and shut herself in a cell to pass the remainder of her days in prayer she died about the year 725 a great part of her relics are kept at blangia end of section four section five of little pictorial lives of the saints by john gilmary shea this librivox recording is in the public domain July 5th, St. Peter of Luxembourg. Peter of Luxembourg, descended both by his father and mother from the noblest families in Europe, was born in Lorraine in the year 1369. But when a schoolboy, twelve years of age, he went to London as a hostage for his brother, the Count of St. Paul, who had been taken prisoner. 
the English were so worn by Peter's holy example that they released him at the end of the year, taking his word for the ransom. Richard II now invited him to remain at the English court, but Peter returned to Paris, determined to have no master but Christ. At the early age of fifteen he was appointed, on account of his prudence and sanctity, Bishop of Metz, and made his public entry into his see barefoot and riding an ass. He governed his diocese with all the zeal and prudence of maturity, and divided his revenues in three parts, for the church, the poor, and his household. His charities often left him personally destitute, and he had but twenty pence left when he died. Created Cardinal of St. George, his austerities in the midst of a court were so severe that he was ordered to moderate them. Peter replied, I shall always be an unprofitable servant, but I can at least obey. Ten months after his promotion, he fell sick of a fever, and lingered for some time in a sinking condition, his holiness increasing as he drew near his end. St. Peter, it was believed, never stained his soul by mortal sin, yet as he grew in grace his holy hatred of self became more and more intense. At length, when he had received the last sacraments, he forced his attendants, each in turn, to scourge him for his faults, and then lay silent till he died. But God was pleased to glorify his servant. Among other miracles is the following. On July 5, 1432, a child about twelve years old was killed by falling from a high tower in the palace of Avignon, upon a sharp rock. The father, distracted with grief, picked up the scattered pieces of the skull and brains, and carried them in a sack with the mutilated body of his son to St. Peter's shrine, and with many tears besought the saint's intercession. After a while the child returned to life, and was placed upon the altar for all to witness. In honor of this miracle, the city of Avignon chose St. Peter as its patron saint. He died A.D. 1387, aged 18 years. Reflection. St. Peter teaches us how, by self-denial, rank, riches, the highest dignities, and all this world can give, may serve to make a saint. End of section 5《ซ6》of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. July 6. St. Gohar, Priest. St. Gohar was born of an illustrious family at Aquitaine. From his youth he was noted for his earnest piety, and having been raised to sacred orders, he converted many sinners by the fervor of his preaching and the force of his example. Wishing to serve God entirely unknown to the world, he went over into Germany, and settling in the neighborhood of Trier, he shut himself up in his cell, and arrived at such an eminent degree of sanctity as to be esteemed the oracle and miracle of the whole country. Siegbert, king of Austrasia, learned of the sanctity of Goar, wished to have him made bishop of Metz, and for that purpose summoned him to court. The saint, fearing the responsibilities of the office, prayed that he might be excused. He was seized with a fever, and died in 575. St. Palatius, Bishop, Apostle of the Scots The name of Palatius shows the saint to have been a Roman, and most authors agree that he was deacon of the Church of Rome. At least St. Prosper, in his chronicle, informs us that when Agricola, a noted Pelagian, had corrupted the churches of Britain by introducing that pestilential heresy, Pope Celestine, at the instance of Palatius the deacon in 429, sent thither St. Germanus, bishop of Auxerre, in quality of his legate, who, having ejected the heretics, brought back the Britons to the Catholic faith. In 431, Pope Celestine sent Palladius, the first bishop, to the Scots then believing in Christ. The Irish writers of the lives of St. Patrick say that St. Palladius had preached in Ireland a little before St. Patrick, but that he was soon banished by the King of Leinster, and returned to North Britain, where he had first opened his mission. 
there seems to be no doubt that he was sent to the whole nation of the scots several colonies of whom had passed from ireland into north britain and possessed themselves of part of the country since called scotland after st palladius had left ireland he arrived among the scots in north britain according to st prosper in the consulate of st bassus and antichias in the year of christ four thirty one he preached there with great zeal and formed a considerable church the scottish historians tell us that the faith was planted in north britain about the year two hundred in the time of king donald when victor was pope of rome but they all acknowledge that palladius was the first bishop in that country and style him their first apostle the saint died at forden fifteen miles from aberdeen about the year four fifty reflection st palladius surmounted every obstacle which a fierce nation had opposed to the establishment of the kingdom of jesus christ ought not our hearts to be impressed with the most lively sentiments of love and gratitude to our merciful god for having raised up such great and zealous men by whose ministry the light of true faith has been conveyed to us End of section six. Section seven of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. July seventh, Saint Pentanus, Father of the Church. This learned father, an apostolic man, flourished in the second century. He was by birth a Sicilian by profession a stoic philosopher his esteem for virtue led him into an acquaintance with the christians and being charmed with the innocence and sanctity of their conversation he opened his eyes to the truth he studied the holy scriptures under the disciples of the apostles and his thirst after sacred learning brought him to alexandria in egypt where the disciples of st mark had instituted a celebrated school of the christian doctrine Pantanus sought not to display his talents in that great mart of literature and commerce, but this great progress in sacred learning was after some time discovered, and he was drawn out of that obscurity in which his humility sought to bury itself. Being placed at the head of the Christian school some time before the year 179, by his learning and excellent manner of teaching, he raised its reputation above all the schools of the philosophers and the lessons which he read and which were gathered from the flowers of the prophets and apostles conveyed light and knowledge into the minds of all his hearers the indians who traded at alexandria entreated him to pay their country a visit whereupon he forsook his school and went to preach the gospel to the eastern nations st pantanus found some seeds of the faith already sown in the indies and a book of the gospel of st matthew in hebrew which St. Bartholomew had carried thither. He brought it back with him to Alexandria, whither he returned after he had zealously employed some years in instructing the Indians in the faith. St. Pentanus continued to teach in private till about the year 216, when he closed a noble and excellent life by a happy death. Reflection Have a care that none lead you astray by a false philosophy, says St. Paul for philosophy without religion is a vain thing end of section seven section eight of the little pictorial lives of the saints by john gilmary shea this librivox recording is in the public domain july eighth saint elizabeth of portugal elizabeth was born in twelve seventy one she was daughter of pedro the third of aragon being named after her aunt saint elizabeth of hungary at twelve years of age she was given in marriage to denis king of portugal and from a holy child became a saintly wife she heard mass and recited the divine office daily but her devotions were arranged with such prudence that they interfered with no duty of her state she prepared for her frequent communions by severe austerities fasting thrice a week and by heroic works of charity she was several times called on to make peace between her husband and her son alfonso 
who had taken up arms against him. Her husband tried her much, both by his unfounded jealousy and by his infidelity to herself. A slander affecting Elizabeth and one of her pages made the king determined to slay the youth, and he told a lime-burner to cast into his kiln the first page who should arrive with the royal message. On the day fixed, the page was sent, but the boy, who was in the habit of hearing Mass daily, stopped on his way to do so. The king, in suspense, sent a second page, the very originator of the calumny, who, coming first to the kiln, was at once cast into the furnace and burned. Shortly after, the first page arrived from the church and took back to the king the lime burner's reply that his orders had been fulfilled. Thus hearing mass saved the page's life and proved the queen's innocence. Her patience and the wonderful sweetness with which she even cherished the children of her rivals completely won the king from his evil ways, and he became a devoted husband and a truly Christian king. She built many charitable institutions and religious houses, among others a convent of poor Clares. After her husband's death, she wished to enter their order, but being dissuaded by her people, who could not do without her, she took the habit of the Third Order of St. Francis, and spent the rest of her life in redoubled austerities and almsgiving. She died at the age of sixty-five, while in the act of making peace between her children. Reflection In the holy sacrifice of the altar, St. Elizabeth daily found strength to bear with sweetness, suspicion, and cruelty, and by that same holy sacrifice her innocence was proved. What succor do we forfeit by neglect of daily Mass? End of section 8《ヴァルドリコ・ヴァルドリコ・ヴァルドリコ・ヴァルドリコ・ヴァルドリコ・ヴァルドリコ・ヴァルドリコ・ヴァルドリコ・ヴァルドリコ・ヴァルドリコ・ヴァルドリコ・ヴァルドリコ・ヴァルドリコ・ヴァルドリコ・ヴァルドリコ・ヴァルドリコ・ヴァルドリコ・ヴァルドリコ・ヴァルドリコ・ヴァルドリコ・There to teach what he had learned so well. He defended the faith against heresies in books which have made him known as the prophet of the Syrians. Crowds hung upon his words. Tears used to stop his voice when he preached. He trembled and made his hearers tremble at the thought of God's judgments, but he found in compunction and humility the way to peace, and he rested with unshaken confidence in the mercy of our blessed Lord. I'm setting out, he said, speaking of his own death. I'm setting out on a journey hard and dangerous. Thee, O son of God, I've taken for my viaticum. When I'm hungry, I will feed on thee. The infernal fire will not venture near me, for it cannot bear the fragrance of thy body and thy blood. His hymns won the hearts of the people, drove out the hymns of the Gnostic heretics, and gained for him the title which he bears in the Syriac liturgy to this day. The harp of the Holy Ghost. Passionate as he was by nature, from the time he entered religion, no one ever saw him angry. Abounding in labors till the last, he toiled for the suffering poor at Edessa in the famine of 378, and there lay down to die in extreme old age. What was the secret of success so various and so complete? Humility, which made him distrust himself and trust God. Till his death he wept for the slight sins committed in the thoughtlessness of boyhood. He refused the dignity of the priesthood. I, he told St. Basil, whom he went to see at the bidding of the Holy Spirit, I am that Ephraim who have wandered from the path of heaven. Then bursting into tears he cried out, O my father, have pity on a sinful wretch, and lead me on the narrow way. Reflection Humility is the path which leads to abiding peace and brings us near to the consolations of God. End of section 9 Section 10 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. July 10th The Seven Brothers, Martyrs, 
and St. Felicitas, their mother. The illustrious martyrdom of these saints happened at Rome under the Emperor Antonius. The seven brothers were the sons of St. Felicitas, a noble, pious Christian widow in Rome, who, after the death of her husband, served God in a state of continency and employed herself wholly in prayer, fasting, and works of charity. By the public and edifying example of this lady and her whole family, many idolaters were moved to renounce the worship of their false gods and to embrace the faith of Christ. This excited the anger of the heathen priests, who complained to the emperor that the boldness with which Felicitas publicly practiced the Christian religion drew many from the worship of the immortal gods, who were the guardians and protectors of the empire, and that in order to appease these false gods, it was necessary to compel this lady and her children to sacrifice to them. Publius, the prefect of Rome, caused the mother and her sons to be apprehended and brought before him, and addressing her, said, Take pity on your children, Felicitas. They are in the bloom of youth, and may aspire to the greatest honors and preferments. The Holy Mother answered, Your pity is really impiety, and the compassion to which you exhort me would make me the most cruel of mothers. Then turning herself towards her children, she said to them, My sons, look up to heaven, where Jesus Christ with his saints expects you. Be faithful in his love, and fight courageously for your souls. Publius, being exasperated at this behavior, commanded her to be cruelly buffeted. He then called the children to him, one after another, and used many artful speeches, mingling promises with threats to induce them to adore the gods. His arguments and threats were equally in vain, and the brothers were condemned to be scourged. After being whipped, they were remanded to prison. And the prefect, despairing to overcome their resolution, laid the whole process before the emperor. Antoninus gave an order that they should be sent to different judges and be condemned to different deaths. Januarius was scourged to death with whips loaded with plummets of lead. The two next, Felix and Philip, were beaten with clubs till they expired. Sylvanus, the fourth, was thrown headlong down a steep precipice. The three youngest, Alexander, Vitalis, and Martialis were beheaded, and the same sentence was executed upon the mother four months after. Reflection What afflictions do parents daily meet with from the disorders into which their children fall through their own bad example or neglect? Let them imitate the earnestness of St. Felicitas in forming to perfect virtue the tender souls which God hath committed to their charge and with the saint they will have the greatest of all comforts in them, and will by his grace count as many saints in their family as they are blessed with children. End of section 10this eminent saint and glorious doctor of the Syriac Church was a native of Nisibius in Mesopotamia. In his youth entering the world, he trembled at the sight of its vices and the slippery path of its pleasures, and he thought it the safer part to strengthen himself in retirement, that he might afterward be the better able to stand his ground in the field. He accordingly chose the highest mountain for his abode sheltering himself in a cave in the winter, and the rest of the year living in the woods, continually exposed to the open air. Notwithstanding his desire to live unknown to men, he was discovered, and many were not afraid to climb the rugged rocks that they might recommend themselves to his prayers and receive the comfort of his spiritual advice. He was favored with the gifts of prophecy and miracles in an uncommon measure. One day, as he was traveling, he was accosted by a gang of beggars with a view of extorting money from him under pretense of burying their companion, who lay stretched on the ground as if he were dead. The holy man gave them what they asked, and offering up supplications to God as for a soul departed, 
he prayed that his divine majesty would pardon him the sins he had committed whilst he lived and that he would also admit him into the company of the saints as soon as the saint was gone by the beggars calling upon their companion to rise and take his share of the booty were surprised to find him really dead seized with sudden fear and grief they shrieked in the utmost consternation and immediately ran after the man of god cast themselves at his feet confessed the cheat begged forgiveness and besought him by his prayers to restore their unhappy companion to life which the saint did the most famous miracle of our saint was that by which he protected his native city from the barbarians sapor the second the haughty king of persia besieged nisibius with the whole strength of his empire whilst our saint was bishop the bishop would not pray for the destruction of any one but he implored the divine mercy that the city might be delivered from the calamities of so long a siege afterward going to the top of a high tower and turning his face towards the enemy and seeing the prodigious multitude of men and beasts which covered the whole country he said lord thou art able by the weakest means to humble the pride of thy enemies defeat these multitudes by an army of gnats god heard the humble prayer of his servant scarce had the saint spoken these words when whole clouds of gnats and flies came pouring down upon the persians got into the elephants trunks and the horses ears and nostrils which made them chafe and foam throw the riders and put the whole army into confusion and disorder a famine and pestilence which followed carried off a great part of the army and sapor after lying above three months before the place set fire to all his engines of war and was forced to abandon the siege and return home with the loss of twenty thousand men sapor received a third foil under the walls of nisipius in three fifty nine upon which he turned his arms against amadas took that strong city and put the garrison and the greatest part of the inhabitants to the sword the citizens of nisipius attributed their preservation to the intercession of their glorious patron st james although he had already gone to his reward he died in three fifty End of section 11. Section 12 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. July 12th, St. John Galbert. St. John Galbert was born at Florence, A.D. 999 following the profession of arms at that troubled period he became involved in a blood feud with a near relative one good friday as he was riding into florence accompanied by armed men he encountered his enemy in a place where neither could avoid the other john would have slain him but his adversary who was totally unprepared to fight fell upon his knees with his arms stretched out in the form of a cross and implored him for the sake of our lord's holy passion to spare his life st john said to his enemy i cannot refuse what you ask in christ's name i grant you your life and i give you my friendship pray that god may forgive me my sin grace triumphed a humble and changed man he entered the church of st manato which was near and whilst he prayed the figure of our crucified lord before which he was kneeling bowed its head toward him as if to ratify his pardon abandoning the world he gave himself up to prayer and penance in the benedictine order later he was led to found the congregation called of valambrosa from the shady valley a few miles from florence where he established his first monastery once the enemies of the saint came to his convent of saint salvi plundered it and set fire to it and having treated the monks with ignominy beat them and wounded them st john rejoiced now he said you are true monks would that i myself had had the honour of being with you when the soldiers came that i might have had a share in the glory of your crowns he fought manfully against simony and in many ways promoted the interest of the faith in italy after a life of great austerity he died whilst the angels were singing round his bed july twelfth 
1073. Reflection. The heroic act which merited for St. John Gualbert his conversion was the forgiveness of his enemy. Let us imitate him in this virtue, resolving never to revenge ourselves in deed, in word, or in thought. End of section 12. Section 13 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. July 13th, St. Eugenius, Bishop. The Episcopal See of Carthage had remained vacant 24 years when in 481 Huneric permitted the Catholics on certain conditions to choose one who should fill it. The people, impatient to enjoy the comfort of a pastor, pitched upon Eugenius, a citizen of Carthage, eminent for his learning, zeal, piety, and prudence. His charities to the distressed were excessive, and he refused himself everything that he might give all to the poor. His virtue gained him the respect and esteem even of the Arians, but at length envy and blind zeal got the ascendant in their breasts and the king sent him an order never to sit on the episcopal throne, preach to the people, or admit into his chapel any vandals, among whom several were Catholics. The saint boldly answered that the laws of God commanded him not to shut the door of his church to any that desired to serve him in it. Uneric, enraged at this answer, persecuted the Catholics in various ways. Many nuns were so cruelly tortured that they died on the rack. Great numbers of bishops, priests, deacons, and eminent Catholic laymen were banished to a desert filled with scorpions and venomous serpents. The people followed their bishops and priests with lighted tapers in their hands, and mothers carried their little babes in their arms and laid them at the feet of the confessors, all crying out with tears, Going yourself to your crowns, to whom do you leave us? Who will baptize our children? who will impart to us the benefit of penance and discharge us from the bonds of sin by the favor of reconciliation and pardon, who will bury us with solemn supplications at our death, by whom will the divine sacrifice be made? The bishop Eugenius was spared in the first storm, but afterwards was carried into the uninhabited desert country in the province of Tripolis and committed to the guard of Antony, an inhuman Arian bishop who treated him with the utmost barbarity. Gontamund, who seceded Huneric, recalled our saint to Carthage, opened the Catholic churches, and allowed all the exiled priests to return. After reigning twelve years, Gontamund died, and his brother Thrasimund was called to the crown. Under this prince, St. Eugenius was again banished and died in exile on the 13th of July. 505, in a monastery which he built and governed, near Albi. Reflection. Alms shall be a great confidence before the Most High God to them that give it. Water quencheth the flaming fire, and alms resisteth sin. End of section 13. Section 14 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. July 14th, St. Bonaventure. Sanctity and learning raised Bonaventure to the church's highest honors, and from a child he was the companion of saints. Yet at heart he was ever the poor Franciscan friar, and practiced and taught humility and mortification. St. Francis gave him his name, for having miraculously cured him of a mortal sickness, he prophetically exclaimed of the child, O Bonaventura, good luck. He is known also as the seraphic doctor, from the fervor of divine love which breathes in his writings. He was the friend of St. Thomas Aquinas, who asked him one day whence he drew his great learning. He replied by pointing to his crucifix. At another time St. Thomas found him in ecstasy while writing the life of St. Francis, and exclaimed, Let us leave a saint to write of a saint. They received the doctor's cap together. He was the guest and adviser of St. Louis, 
and the director of St. Isabella, the king's sister. At the age of thirty-five he was made general of his order, and only escaped another dignity, the Archbishopric of York, by dint of tears and entreaties. Gregory X appointed him Cardinal Bishop of Albano. When the saint heard of the Pope's resolve to create him a cardinal, he quietly made his escape from Italy, but Gregory sent him a summons to return to Rome. On his way he stopped to rest himself at a convent of his order near Florence, and there two papal messengers, sent to meet him with the cardinal's hat, found him washing the dishes. The saint desired them to hang the hat on a bush that was near, and take a walk in the garden until he had finished what he was about. Then, taking up the hat with unfeigned sorrow, he joined the messengers, and paid them the respect due to their character. He sat at the pontiff's right hand, and spoke first at the Council of Lyon. His piety and eloquence won over the Greeks to Catholic Union, and then his strength failed. He died while the council was sitting, and was buried by the assembled bishops, A.D. 1274. Reflection the fear of God, says St. Bonaventure, forbids a man to give his heart to transitory things, which are the true seeds of sin. End of section 14 Section 15 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. July 15th, St. Henry, Emperor Henry, Duke of Bavaria, saw in a vision his guardian, St. Wolfgang, pointing to the words, After six. This moved him to prepare for death, and for six years he continued to watch and pray. When at the end of the sixth year he found the warning verified in his election as emperor, thus trained in the fear of God, he ascended the throne with but one thought, to reign for his greater glory. The pagan Slavs were then despoiling the empire. Henry attacked them with a small force, but angels and saints were seen leading the troops, and the heathen fled in despair. Poland and Bohemia, Moravia, and Burgundy were in turn annexed in his kingdom. Pannonia and Hungary won to the church. With a faith secured in Germany, Henry passed into Italy, drove out the anti-pope Gregory, brought Benedict the eighth back to rome and was crowned in st peter's by that pontiff in ten fourteen it was henry's custom on arriving in any town to spend his first night in watching in some church dedicated to our blessed lady as he was thus praying in st mary majors the first night of his arrival in rome he saw the sovereign and eternal priest christ jesus enter to say mass Saints Lawrence and Vincent assisted as deacon and subdeacon. Saints innumerable filled the church, and angels sang in the choir. After the gospel, an angel was sent by Our Lady to give Henry the book to kiss. Touching him lightly on the thigh, as the angel did to Jacob, he said, Accept the sign of God's love for your chastity and justice. And from that time the emperor always was lame. Like holy David, Henry employed the fruits of his conquests in the service of the temple. The forests and mines of the empire, the best that his treasury could produce, were consecrated to the sanctuary. Stately cathedrals, noble monasteries, churches innumerable, enlightened and sanctified the once heathen lands. In 1022 Henry lay on his bed of death. He gave back to her parents his wife, St. Cunegonda, a virgin still, as a virgin, he had received her from Christ, and surrendered his own pure soul to God. Reflection St. Henry deprived himself of many things to enrich the house of God. We clothe ourselves in purple and fine linen, and leave Jesus in poverty and neglect. End of section 15 Section 16 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. July 16th, St. Simon Stock. Simon was born in the county of Kent, England, and left his home when he was but twelve years of age. 
to live as a hermit in the hollow trunk of a tree, whence he was known as Simon of the Stock. Here he passed twenty years in penance and prayer, and learned from Our Lady that he was to join an order not then known in England. He waited in patience till the white friars came, and then entered the order of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. His great holiness moved his brethren and the general chapter held at Islesford near Rochester in 1245 to choose him prior general of the order. In the many persecutions raised against the new religious, Simon went with filial confidence to the Blessed Mother of God. As he knelt in prayer in the White Friars Convent at Cambridge on July 16, 1251, she appeared before him and presented him with the scapular in assurance of her protection. The devotion to the blessed habit spread quickly throughout the Christian world. Pope after Pope enriched it with indulgences, and miracles innumerable put their seal upon its efficacy. The first of them was worked at Winchester on a man dying in despair, who at once asked for the sacraments, when the scapular was laid upon him by St. Simon Stock. In the year 1636, M. de Gouges, a cornet in a cavalry regiment, was mortally wounded at the engagement of Tain, a bullet having lodged near his heart. He was then in a state of grievous sin, but had time left him to make his confession, and with his own hands wrote his last testament. When this was done, the surgeon probed the wound, and the bullet was found to have driven his scapular into his heart. On his being withdrawn, he presently expired making profound acts of gratitude to the Blessed Virgin, who had prolonged his life miraculously and thus preserved him from eternal death. St. Simon Stock died at Bordeaux, A.D. 1265. Reflection. To enjoy the privileges of the scapular, it is sufficient that it be received lawfully and worn devoutly. How, then, can anyone fail to profit by a devotion so easy, so simple, and so wonderfully blessed? He that shall overcome shall thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, and I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Apocalypse 3, 5 End of section 16section 17 of Little Victoria Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. July 17th, St. Alexius. St. Alexius was the only son of parents preeminent among the Roman nobles for virtue, birth, and wealth. On his wedding night, by God's special inspiration, he secretly quitted Rome, and, journeying to Edessa in the Far East, gave away all that he had brought with him content thenceforth to live on alms at the gate of Our Lady's Church in that city. It came to pass that the servants of St. Alexius, whom his father sent in search of him, arrived at Edessa, and seeing him among the poor at the gate of Our Lady's Church, gave him an alms, not recognizing him. Whereupon the man of God, rejoicing, said, I thank thee, O Lord, who hast called me, and granted that I should receive for thy name's sake an alms from my own slaves, deign to fulfill in me the work thou hast begun. After seventeen years, when his sanctity was miraculously manifested by the Blessed Virgin's image, he once more sought obscurity by flight. On his way to Tarsus, contrary winds drove his ship to Rome. There no one recognized in the wan and tattered mendicant the heir of Rome's noblest house, not even his sorrowing parents, who had vainly sent throughout the world in search of him. From his father's charity he begged a mean corner of his palace as a shelter, and the leavings of his table as food. Thus he spent seventeen years, bearing patiently the mockery and ill-usage of his own slaves, and witnessing daily the inconsolable grief of his spouse and parents. At last, when death had ended this cruel martyrdom, they learned too late, from a writing in his own hand, who it was that they had unknowingly sheltered. God bore testimony to his servant's sanctity by many miracles. He died early in the fifth century. Reflection. 
we must always be ready to sacrifice our dearest and best natural affections in obedience to the call of our heavenly father call none your father upon earth for one is your father in heaven matthew twenty three nine our lord has taught us this not by words only but by his own example and by that of his saints End of section 17section 18 of little pictorial lives of the saints by john gilmary shea this librivox recording is in the public domain july 18th saint camillus of lelis the early years of camillus gave no sign of sanctity at the age of 19 he took service with his father an italian noble against the turks and after four years hard campaigning found himself through his violent temper, reckless habits, and inveterate passion for gambling, a discharged soldier, and in such straitened circumstances that he was obliged to work as a laborer on a Capuchin convent which was then building. A few words from a Capuchin friar brought about his conversion, and he resolved to become a religious. Thrice he entered the Capuchin novitiate, but each time an obstinate wound in his leg forced him to leave. He repaired to Rome for medical treatment, and there took St. Philip as his confessor, and entered the hospital of St. Giacomo, of which he became in time the superintendent. The carelessness of the paid chaplains and nurses toward the suffering patients now inspired him with the thought of founding a congregation to minister to their wants. With this end he was ordained priest, and in 1586 his community of the servants of the sick was confirmed by the pope its usefulness was soon felt not only in hospitals but in private houses summoned at every hour of the day and night the devotion of camillus never grew cold with a woman's tenderness he attended to the needs of his patients he wept with them consoled them and prayed with them he knew miraculously the state of their souls and St. Philip saw angels whispering to two servants of the sick who were consoling a dying person. One day a sick man said to the saint, Father, may I beg you to make up my bed? It is very hard. Camillus replied, God forgive you, brother. You beg me. Don't you know yet that you are to command me? For I am your servant and slave. Would to God, he would cry, that in the hour of my death one sigh or one blessing of these poor creatures might fall upon me. His prayer was heard. He was granted the same consolations in his last hour, which he had so often procured for others. In the year 1614 he died with a full use of his faculties, after two weeks saintly preparation, as the priest was reciting the words of the ritual. May Jesus Christ appear to thee with a mild and joyful countenance. Reflection. St. Camillus venerated the sick as living images of Christ, and by ministering to them in the spirit did penance for the sins of his youth, led a life precious in merit, and from a violent and quarrelsome soldier became a gentle and tender saint. End of section 18. Section 19 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. July 19th, St. Vincent of Paul. St. Vincent was born A.D. 1576. In after years, when advisor of the Queen and Oracle of the Church in France, he loved to recount how in his youth he had guarded his father's pigs soon after his ordination he was captured by corsairs and carried into barbary he converted his renegade master and escaped with him to france appointed chaplain general of the galleys of france his tender charity brought hope into those prisons where hitherto despair had reigned a mother mourned her imprisoned son vincent put on his chains and took his place at the oar and gave him to his mother his charity embraced the poor, young and old, provinces desolated by civil war, Christians enslaved by the infidel. 
the poor man ignorant and degraded was to him the image of him who became as a leper and no man turn the metal he said and you then will see jesus christ he went through the streets of paris at night seeking the children who were left there to die once robbers rushed upon him thinking he carried a treasure but when he opened his cloak they recognized him and his burden and fell at his feet not only was st vincent the saviour of the poor but also of the rich for he taught them to do works of mercy when the work for the foundlings was in danger of failing from want of funds he assembled the ladies of the association of charity he bade his most fervent daughters be present to give the spur to the others then he said compassion and charity have made you adopt these little creatures as your children you have been their mothers according to grace when their own mothers abandoned them cease to be their mothers that you may become their judges their life and death are in your hands i shall now take your votes it is time to pronounce sentence the tears of the assembly were his only answer and the work was continued the society of st vincent the priests of the mission and twenty-five thousand sisters of charity still comfort the afflicted with the charity of st vincent de paul he died a d sixteen sixty reflection most people who profess piety ask advice of directors about their prayers and spiritual exercises few inquire whether they are not in danger of damnation from neglect of works of charity End of section nineteen section twenty of little pictorial lives of the saints by john gilmary shea this librivox recording is in the public domain july twentieth st margaret virgin and martyr according to the ancient martyrologies st margaret suffered at antioch in Bithynia, in the last general persecution she is said to have been instructed in the faith by a christian nurse to have been prosecuted by her own father a pagan priest and after many torments to have gloriously finished her martyrdom by the sword from the east her veneration was exceedingly propagated in england france and germany in the eleventh century during the holy wars her body is now kept at monte fiascone in tuscany st jerome emiliani st jerome emiliani was a member of one of the patrician families of venice and like many other saints in early life a soldier he was appointed governor of a fortress among the mountains of treviso and whilst bravely defending his post was made prisoner by the enemy in the misery of his dungeon he invoked the great mother of god and promised if she would set him free to lead a new and a better life our lady appeared broke his fetters and led him forth through the midst of his enemies at treviso he hung up his chains at her altar dedicated himself to her service and on reaching his home at venice devoted himself to a life of active charity his special love was for the deserted orphan children whom in the times of the plague and famine he found wandering in the streets he took them home clothed and fed them and taught them the christian truths from venice he passed to padua and verona and in a few years had founded orphanages through northern italy some pious clerics and laymen who had been his fellow workers fixed their abode in one of these establishments and devoted themselves to the cause of education the saint drew up for them a rule of life and thus was founded the congregation which still exists of the clerks regular of somashka st jerome died february eighth fifteen thirty seven of an illness which he had caught in visiting the sick reflection let us learn from st jerome to exert ourselves in behalf of the many hundred children whose souls are perishing around us for want of someone to show them the way to heaven end of section twenty section twenty one of little pictorial lives of the saints by john gilmary shea this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. July 21st. St. Victor, Martyr. 
the emperor maximian reeking with the blood of the Thebian legion and many other martyrs arrived at marseilles where the church then flourished the tyrant breathed here nothing but slaughter and fury and his coming filled the christians with fear and alarm in this general consternation victor a christian officer and the troops went about in the night-time from house to house visiting the faithful and inspiring them with contempt of a temporal death and the love of eternal life he was surprised in this and brought before the prefects asterius and eutychius who exhorted him not to lose the fruit of all his services and the favor of his prince for the worship of a dead man as they called jesus christ he answered that he renounced those recompenses if he could not enjoy them without being unfaithful to jesus christ the eternal son of god who vouchsafed to become man for our salvation but who raised himself from the dead and reigns with the father being god equally with him the whole court heard him with shouts of rage victor was bound hand and foot and dragged through the streets of the city exposed to the blows and insults of the populace he was brought back bruised and bloody to the tribunal of the prefects who thinking his resolution might have been weakened by his sufferings pressed him again to adore their gods but the martyr filled with the holy ghost expressed his respect for the emperor and his contempt for their gods he was then hoisted on the rack and tortured a long time till the tormentors being at last weary the prefect ordered him to be taken down and thrown into a dark dungeon at midnight god visited him by his angels the prison was filled with a light brighter than that of the sun and the martyr sung with the angels the praises of god three soldiers who guarded the prison seeing this light cast themselves at the martyr's feet asking his pardon and desired baptism victor instructed them as well as time would permit sent for priests the same night and going with them to the seaside had them baptized and returned with them again to the prison the next morning maximian was informed of the conversion of the guards and in a transport of rage sent officers to bring them all four before him the three soldiers persevered in the confession of jesus christ and by the emperor's orders were forthwith beheaded victor having been exposed to the insults of the whole city and been beaten with clubs and scourged with leather thongs was carried back to prison where he continued three days recommending to god his martyrdom with many tears after that term the emperor called him again before his tribunal and commanded the martyr to offer incense to a statue of jupiter victor went up to the profane altar and by a kick of his foot threw it down the emperor ordered the foot to be forthwith chopped off which the saint suffered with great joy offering to god these first fruits of his body a few moments after the emperor condemned him to be put under the grindstone of a handmill and crushed to death the executioners turned the wheel and when part of his body was bruised and crushed the mill broke down the saint still breathed a little but his head was immediately ordered to be cut off he and the other three bodies were thrown into the sea but being cast ashore were buried by the christians in a grotto hewn out of a rock End of section twenty one Section 22 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. July 22nd. St. Mary Magdalene. Of the earlier life of Mary Magdalene, we know only that she was a woman who was a sinner. From the depth of her degradation, she raised her eyes to Jesus with sorrow, hope, and love. All covered with shame, she came in where Jesus was at meat, and knelt behind him. She said not a word, but bathed his feet with her tears, wiped them with the hair of her head, kissed them in humility, and at their touch her sins and her stain were gone. Then she poured on them the costly unguent prepared for far other uses, and his own divine lips rolled away her reproach 
spoke her absolution and bade her go in peace thenceforward she ministered to jesus sat at his feet and heard his words she was one of the family whom jesus so loved that he raised her brother lazarus from the dead once again on the eve of his passion she brought the precious ointment and now purified and beloved poured it on his head and the whole house of god is still filled with the fragrance of her anointing she stood with our lady and saint john at the foot of the cross the representative of the many who have had much forgiven to her first after her blessed mother and through her to his apostles our lord gave the certainty of his resurrection and to her first he made himself known calling her by her name because she was his when the faithful were scattered by persecution the family of bethany found refuge in province the cave in which saint mary lived for thirty years is still seen and the chapel on the mountain top in which he was caught up daily like saint paul to visions and revelations of the lord when her end drew near she was borne to a spot still marked by a sacred pillar where the holy bishop maximin awaited her and when she had received her lord she peacefully fell asleep in death reflection compunction of heart says saint bernard is a treasure infinitely to be desired and an unspeakable gladness to the heart it is healing to the soul it is remission of sins it brings back again the holy spirit into the humble and loving heart end of section twenty two section twenty three of little pictorial lives of the saints by john gilmary shea this librivox recording is in the public domain july twenty third saint apollinaris bishop and martyr saint apollinaris was the first bishop of ravenna he sat twenty years and was crowned with martyrdom in the reign of vespasian he was a disciple of saint peter and made by him bishop of ravenna saint peter chrysologus the most illustrious among his successors has left us a sermon in honour of our saint in which he often styles him a martyr but adds that though he frequently suffered for the faith and ardently desired to lay down his life for christ yet god preserved him a long time to his church and did not allow the persecutors to take away his life so he seems to have been a martyr only by the torments he endured for christ which he survived at least some days his body lay first at classis four miles from ravenna still a kind of suburb to that city and at seaport till it was choked up by the sands in the year five forty nine his relics were removed into a more secret vault in the same church saint fortunatus exhorted his friends to make pilgrimage to the tombs and saint gregory the great ordered parties in doubtful suits at law to be sworn before it pope honorius built a church under the name of apollinaris in rome about the year six thirty it occurs in all martyrologies and the high veneration which the church paid early to his memory is a sufficient testimony of his eminent sanctity and apostolic spirit reflection the virtue of the saints was true and heroic because humble and proof against all trials persevere in your good resolutions it is not enough to begin well you must so continue to the end end of section twenty three section twenty four of little pictorial lives of the saints by john gilmary shea this librivox recording is in the public domain july twenty fourth saint christina virgin and martyr saint christina was the daughter of a rich and powerful magistrate named urbane her father who was deep in the practices of heathenism had a number of golden idols which our saint destroyed and distributed the pieces among the poor infuriated by this act urbane became the persecutor of his daughter he had her whipped with rods and then thrown into a dungeon christina remained unshaken in her faith her tormentor then had her body torn by iron hooks and fastened her to a rack beneath which a fire was kindled 
but God watched over his servant and turned the flames upon the lookers-on. Christina was next seized, a heavy stone tied about her neck, and she was thrown into the lake of Bolsena. But she was saved by an angel and outlived her father, who died of spite. Later, this martyr suffered the most inhuman torments under the judge who seceded her father, and finally was thrown into a burning furnace where she remained unhurt for five days. By the power of Christ she overcame the serpents among which she was thrown. Then her tongue was cut out, and afterwards, being pierced with arrows, she gained the martyr's crown at Tyro, a city which formerly stood on an island in the lake of Bolsena in Italy, but was long since swallowed up by the waters. Her relics are now at Palermo in Sicily. End of section 24「Section 25 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. July 25th. St. James, Apostle. Among the twelve, three were chosen as the familiar companions of our blessed Lord, and of these James was one. He alone with Peter and John was admitted to the house of Jairus, when the dead maiden was raised to life. They alone were taken up to the high mountain apart, and saw the face of Jesus shining as the sun, and his garments white as snow. And these three alone witnessed the fearful agony in Gethsemane. What was it that won James a place among the favorite three? Faith, burning, impetuous, and outspoken, but which needed purifying before the Son of Thunder could proclaim the gospel of peace was James who demanded fire from heaven to consume the inhospitable Samaritans, and who sought the place of honor by Christ in his kingdom. Yet our Lord, in rebuking his presumption, prophesied his faithfulness to death. When St. James was brought before King Herod Agrippa, his fearless confession of Jesus crucified so moved the public prosecutor that he declared himself a Christian on the spot. Accused and accuser were hurried off together to execution, and on the road the latter begged pardon of the saint. The apostle had long since forgiven him, but hesitated for a moment whether publicly to accept as a brother one still unbaptized. God quickly recalled to him the church's faith that the blood of martyrdom supplies for every sacrament, and falling on his companion's neck, he embraced him with the words, Peace be with thee. Together then they knelt for the sword and together receive the crown. Reflection. We must all desire a place in the kingdom of our Father, but can we drink the chalice which he holds out to each? Posumos, we must say with St. James, we can, but only in the strength of him who has drunk it first for us. End of section 25 Section 26 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. July 26. St. Anne. St. Anne was the spouse of St. Joachim, and was chosen by God to be the mother of Mary, his own blessed mother on earth. They were both of the royal house of David, and their lives were wholly occupied in prayer and good works. One thing only was wanting to their union. They were childless, and this was held as a bitter misfortune among the Jews. At length, when Anne was an aged woman, Mary was born, the fruit rather of grace than of nature, and the child more of God than of man. With the birth of Mary, the aged Anne began a new life. She watched her every movement with reverent tenderness, and felt herself hourly sanctified by the presence of her immaculate child. But she had vowed her daughter to God. To God Mary had consecrated herself again, and to him Anne gave her back. Mary was three years old when Anne and Joachim led her up to the temple steps, saw her pass by herself into the inner sanctuary, and then saw her no more. Thus was Anne left childless in her lone old age, and deprived of her purest earthly joy just when she needed it most. 
she humbly adored the divine will and began again to watch and pray till god called her to unending rest with the father and the spouse of mary in the home of mary's child reflection saint anne is glorious among the saints not only as the mother of mary but because she gave mary to god learn from her to reverence a divine vocation as the highest privilege and to sacrifice every natural tie however holy at the call of god end of section twenty six Section 27 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. July 27th, St. Pantaleon, Martyr. St. Pantaleon was physician to the Emperor Galerius Maximianus and a Christian, but deceived by often hearing the false maxims of the world applauded was unhappily seduced into an apostasy. But a zealous Christian called Hermolaus awakened his conscience to a sense of his guilt and brought him again into the fold of the church. The penitent ardently wished to expiate his crime by martyrdom and to prepare himself for the conflict when Diocletian's bloody persecution broke out in Nicomedia in 303. He distributed all his possessions among the poor, not long after this action he was taken up and in his house were also apprehended hermolaus hermupus and hermocrates after suffering many torments they were all condemned to lose their heads saint pantaleon suffered the day after the rest his relics were translated to constantinople and they are kept with great honor the greatest part of them are now shown in the abbey of saint denis near Paris, but his head is at Lyon. Reflection. With the elect thou shalt be elect, and with the perverse wilt be perverted. End of section 27. Section 28 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. July 28. Saints Nazarius and Celsus, Martyrs. Saint Nazarius's father was a heathen and held a considerable post in the Roman army. His mother, Perpetua, was a zealous Christian and was instructed by Saint Peter or his disciples in the most perfect maxims of our holy faith. Nazarius embraced it with so much ardor that he copied in his life all the great virtues he saw in his teachers and out of zeal for the salvation of others he left rome his native city and preached the faith in many places with a fervor and disinterestedness becoming a disciple of the apostles arriving at milan he was there beheaded for the faith together with celsus a youth whom he carried with him to assist him in his travels these martyrs suffered soon after nero had raised the first persecution their bodies were buried separately in a garden without the city, where they were discovered and taken up by St. Ambrose in 395. In the tomb of St. Nazarius, a vial of the saint's blood was found as fresh and red as if it had been spilt that day. The faithful stained handkerchiefs with some drops and also formed a certain paste with it, a portion of which St. Ambrose sent to St. Gaudentius, Bishop of Brescia st ambrose conveyed the bodies of the two martyrs into the new church of the apostles which he had just built a woman was delivered of an evil spirit in their presence st ambrose sent some of these relics to st polinus of nola who received them with great respect as a most valuable present as he testifies reflection the martyrs died as the outcasts of the world but are crowned by god with immortal honor the glory of the world is false and transitory and an empty bubble or shadow but that of virtue is true solid and permanent even in the eyes of men end of section twenty eight
Section 29 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. July 29th, St. Martha, Virgin. St. John tells us that Jesus loved Martha and Mary and Lazarus, and yet few glimpses are vouchsafed us of them. First, the sisters are set before us with a word. Martha received Jesus into her house and was busy in outward, loving, lavish service, while Mary sat in silence at the feet she had bathed with her tears. Then their brother is ill, and they send to Jesus, Lord, he whom thou lovest is sick. And in his own time the Lord came, and they go out to meet him, and then follows the scene of unutterable tenderness and of sublimity unsurpassed, the silent waiting of Mary. Martha, strong in faith, but realizing so vividly, with her practical turn of mind, the fact of death, and hesitating, Canst thou show thy wonders in the grave? And then once again, on the eve of his passion, we see Jesus at Bethany, Martha, true to her character, is serving. Mary, as at first, pours the precious ointment in adoration and love on his divine head. And then we find the tomb of St. Martha at Tarascon in Provence. When the storm of persecution came, the family of Bethany, with a few companions, were put into a boat without oars or sail and borne to the coast of France. St. Mary's tomb is at St. Baum. St. Lazarus is venerated as the founder of the Church of Marseille, and the memory of the virtues and labors of St. Martha is still fragrant at Avignon and Tarascon. Reflection. When Martha received Jesus into her house, she was naturally busy in preparations for such a guest. Mary sat at his feet, intent alone on listening to his gracious words. Her sister thought that the time required other service than this, and asked our Lord to bid Mary help in serving. Once again Jesus spoke in defense of Mary. Martha, Martha, he said, thou art lovingly anxious about many things, be not over-eager. Do thy chosen work with recollectedness. Judge not Mary. Hers is the good part, the one only thing really necessary. Thine will be taken away, that something better be given thee. The life of action ceases when the body is laid down, but the life of contemplation endures and is perfected in heaven. End of section 29《Section 30 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. July 30th. St. Germanus, Bishop. In his youth, Germanus gave little sign of sanctity. He was of noble birth and at first practiced the law at Rome. After a time, the emperor placed him high in the army, but his one passion was the chase. He was so carried away as even to retain in his sports the superstitions of the pagan huntsmen. Yet it was revealed to the bishop of Ahuer that Germanus would be his successor, and he gave them the tonsor almost by main force. Forthwith Germanus became another man, and making over his lands to the church, adopted a life of humble penance. That time the Pelagian heresy was laying waste England and Germanus was chosen by the reigning pontiff to rescue the Britons from the snare of Satan. With St. Lupus he preached in the fields and highways throughout the land. At last, near Verulam, he met the heretics face to face, and overcame them utterly with the Catholic and Roman faith. He ascribed this triumph to the intercession of St. Alban, and offered public thanks at his shrine. Towards the end of his stay, his old skill in arms won over the Picts and Scots the complete but bloodless Alleluia victory, so called because the newly baptized Britons, led by the saint, routed the enemy with a paschal cry. Germanus visited England a second time with St. Serverus. He died A.D. 448 while interceding with the emperor for the people of Brittany. Reflection Hold the form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me in faith, and in the love which is in Christ Jesus. 
Second Timothy, one, thirteen. End of section thirty. Section thirty one of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. July thirty first. Saint Ignatius of Loyola. Saint Ignatius was born at Loyola in Spain in the year 1491. He served his king as a courtier and a soldier till his thirtieth year. At that age, being laid low by a wound, he received the call of divine grace to leave the world. He embraced poverty and humiliation, that he might become more like to Christ, and won others to join him in the service of God. Prompted by their love for Jesus Christ, Ignatius and his companions made a vow to go to the Holy Land, but war broke out and prevented the execution of their project. Then they turned to the vicar of Jesus Christ and placed themselves under his obedience. This was the beginning of the Society of Jesus. Our Lord promised St. Ignatius that the precious heritage of his passion should never fail his society, a heritage of contradictions and persecutions. St. Ignatius was cast into prison at Salamanca, on a suspicion of heresy. To a friend who expressed sympathy with him on account of his imprisonment, he replied, It is a sign that you have but little love of Christ in your heart, or you would not deem it so hard a fate to be in chains for his sake. I declare to you that all Salamanca does not contain as many fetters, manacles, and chains as I long to wear for the love of Jesus Christ. St. Ignatius went to his crown on the 31st of July, 1556. Reflection Ask St. Ignatius to obtain for you the grace to desire ardently the greater glory of God, even though it may cost you much suffering and humiliation. End of section 31section thirty two of little pictorial lives of the saints by john gilmary shea this librivox recording is in the public domain august the first st peter's chains herod agrippa king of the jews having put to death st james the great in the year forty four in order to gain the affection and applause of his people caused st peter the prince of the sacred college to be cast into prison it was his intention to put him publicly to death after Easter. The whole church at Jerusalem put up its prayers to God for the deliverance of the chief pastor of his whole flock, and God favorably heard them. The king took all precautions possible to prevent the escape of his prisoner. St. Peter lay fast asleep on the very night before the day intended for his execution, when it pleased God to deliver him out of the hands of his enemies. He was guarded by sixteen soldiers, four of whom always kept sentry in their turns, two in the same dungeon with him, and two at the gate. He was fastened to the ground by two chains, and slept between the two soldiers. In the middle of the night a bright light shone in the prison, and an angel appeared near him, and striking him on the side, awaked him out of his sleep, and bade him instantly arise, gird his coat about him put on his sandals and his cloak, and follow him. The apostle did so, for the chains had dropped off from his hands. Following his guide, he passed after him through the first and second wards of watches, and through the iron gate which led into the city, which opened to them of its own accord. The angel conducted him through one street, then suddenly disappearing, left him to seek some asylum. The apostle went directly to the house of Mary, the mother of John, surnamed Mark, where several disciples were met together, and were sending up their prayers to heaven for his deliverance. As he stood knocking without, a young woman, knowing Peter's voice, ran in and informed the company that he was at the door. They concluded it must be his guardian angel, sent by God upon some extraordinary account, until being let in. He related to them the whole manner of his miraculous escape, and having enjoined them to give notice thereof to St. James and the rest of the brethren, he withdrew to a place of more retirement and security, caring, 
wherever he went the heavenly blessing and life reflection this miracle affords a confirmation of the divine promise if two of you shall consent upon earth concerning anything whatsoever they shall ask shall be done to them by my father who is in heaven end of section thirty two Section 33 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. August 2nd. St. Stephen, Pope and Martyr. St. Stephen was by birth a Roman, and being promoted to holy orders, was made archdeacon under the holy Pope St. Cornelius and St. Lucius, the latter having suffered martyrdom. St. Stephen was chosen to secede him and was elected pope on the third of may two hundred and fifty three the controversy concerning the rebaptization of heretics gave st stephen much trouble it is the teaching of the catholic church that baptism given in the name of three persons of the blessed trinity is valid though it be conferred by a heretic st stephen suffered himself patiently to be traduced as a favourer of heresy in approving heretical baptism not doubting but those great men who by mistaken zeal were led astray would when the heat of the dispute had subsided calmly open their eyes to the truth thus by his zeal he preserved the integrity of faith and by his toleration and forbearance saved many souls the persecutions becoming violent he assembled the faithful together in the underground tombs of the martyrs to celebrate mass and to exhort them to remain true to christ on the second of august two hundred and fifty seven while seated in his pontifical chair he was beheaded by the satellites of the emperor and the chair is still shown stained by his blood st alphonsus liguri st alphonsus was born of noble parents near naples in sixteen ninety six his spiritual training was entrusted to the fathers of the oratory in that city and from his boyhood alphonsus was known as a most devout brother of the little oratory at the early age of sixteen he was made doctor in law and he threw himself into this career with ardour and success a mistake by which he lost an important cause showed him the vanity of human fame and determined him to labour only for the glory of god he entered the priesthood devoting himself to the most neglected souls and to carry on this work he found it later the missionary congregation of the most holy redeemer at the age of sixty-six he became bishop of st agatha and undertook the reform of his diocese with the zeal of a saint he made a vow never to lose time and though his life was spent in prayer and work he composed a vast number of books filled with such science unction and wisdom that he has been declared one of the doctors of the church st alphonsus wrote his first book at the age of forty-nine and in his eighty-third year had published about sixty volumes when his director forbade him to write more very many of these books were written in the half hours snatched from his labors as missionary religious superior and bishop or in the midst of continual bodily and mental sufferings with his left hand he would hold a piece of marble against his aching head while his right hand wrote yet he counted no time wasted which was spent in charity he did not refuse to hold a long correspondence with a simple soldier who asked his advice or to play the harpsichord while he taught his novices to sing spiritual canticles he lived in evil times and met with many persecutions and disappointments for his last seven years he was prevented by a constant sickness from offering the adorable sacrifice but he received holy communion daily and his love for jesus christ and his trust in mary's prayers sustained him to the end he died in seventeen eighty seven in his ninety-first year reflection let us do with all our heart the duty of each day leaving the result to god as well as the care of the future End of section 33. Section 34 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.
August 3rd. The finding of St. Stephen's relics. The second festival in honor of the holy proto-martyr, St. Stephen, was instituted by the church on the occasion of the discovery of his precious remains. His body lay long concealed under the ruins of an old tomb in a place twenty miles from Jerusalem, called Kapar Gamala, where stood a church which was served by a venerable priest named Lucian. In the year 415, on Friday, the 3rd of December, about nine o'clock at night, Lucian was sleeping in his bed in the baptistry, where he commonly lay in order to guard the sacred vessels of the church. Being half awake, he saw a tall, comely old man of a venerable aspect, who approached him and, calling him thrice by his name, bid him to go to Jerusalem and tell Bishop John to come and open the tombs in which his remains, and those of certain other servants of Christ, lay, that through their means God might open to many the gates of his clemency. This vision was repeated twice. After the second time, Lucian went to Jerusalem and laid the whole affair before Bishop John, who bade him go and search for the relics, which the bishop concluded would be found under a heap of small stones which lay in a field near his church. In digging up the earth here, three coffins or chests were found. Lucian sent immediately to acquaint Bishop John with this. He was then at the council of Diapolis, and taking along with him Eutonius, bishop of Sabast, and Eleutherius, bishop of Jericho, came to the place. Upon the opening of St. Stephen's coffin, the earth shook, and there came out of the coffin such an agreeable odor that no one remembered to have ever smelled anything like it. There was a vast multitude of people assembled in that place, among whom were many persons afflicted with divers distempers, of whom seventy-three recovered their health upon the spot. They kissed the holy relics, and then shut them up. The bishop consented to leave a small portion of them at Caparcamala. The rest were carried in the coffin, with singing of psalms and hymns, to the church of Zion at Jerusalem. The translation was performed on the 26th of December, on which day the church hath ever since honored the memory of St. Stephen, commemorating the discovery of his relics on the 3rd of August, probably on account of the dedication of some church in his honor. Reflection St. Austin, speaking of the miracles of St. Stephen, addresses himself to his flock as follows. Let us so desire to obtain temporal blessings by his intercession, that we may merit, in imitating him, those who are eternal. End of section 34section 35 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. August 4th. St. Dominic. St. Dominic was born in Spain, A.D. 1170. As a student, he sold his books to feed the poor in a famine, and offered himself in ransom for a slave. At the age of 25, he became superior of the canons regular of Asma, and accompanied his bishop to France. There his heart was well-nigh broken by the ravages of the Albigensian heresy, and his life was henceforth devoted to the conversion of heretics and the defense of the faith. For this end he established his threefold religious order. The convent for nuns was found at first to rescue young girls from heresy and crime. Then a company of apostolic men gathered around him and became the order of friar preachers, Lastly came the tertiaries, persons of both sexes living in the world. God blessed the new order, and France, Italy, Spain, and England welcomed the preaching friars. Our Lady took them under her special protection and whispered to St. Dominic as he preached. It was in 1208, while St. Dominic knelt in the small chapel of Notre Dame de la Proil and implored the great mother of God to save the church, that Our Lady appeared to him gave him the rosary, and bade him go forth and preach. Beads in hand, he revived the courage of the Catholic troops, led them to victory against overwhelming numbers, and finally crushed the heresy. 
His nights were spent in prayer, and though pure as a virgin, thrice before morning broke he scourged himself to blood. His words rescued countless souls, and three times raised the dead to life. At length, on August 6, 1221, the age of fifty-one, he gave up his soul to God. Reflection God has never, said St. Dominic, refused me what I have asked, and he has left us the rosary, that we may learn, with Mary's help, to pray easily and simply in the same holy trust. End of section 35《Section 36 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. August 5th, the dedication of St. Mary ad Nives. There are in Rome three patriarchal churches in which the Pope officiates on different festivals. These are the Basilics of St. John Lateran, St. Peter's on the Vatican Hill and St. Mary Major. This last is so called because it is, both in antiquity and dignity, the first church in Rome among those that are dedicated to God in honor of the Virgin Mary. The name of the Liberian Basilic was given it because it was founded in the time of Pope Liberius in the fourth century, who was consecrated under the title of the Virgin Mary by Sixtus the Third. About the year 435, it is also called St. Mary at Nevis, or at the Snow, from a popular tradition that the Mother of God chose this place for a church, under her invocation by a miraculous snow that fell upon the spot in summer, and by a vision in which she appeared to a patrician named John, who munificently founded and endowed this church in the pontificate of Liberius. The same basilic has sometimes been known by the name of St. Mary ad Precepe, from the holy crib or manger of Bethlehem, in which Christ was laid at his birth. It resembles an ordinary manger, is kept in a case of massive silver, and in it lies an image of a little child, also of silver. On Christmas Day the holy manger is taken out of the case and exposed. It is kept in a sumptuous subterranean chapel in this church. Reflection. To render our supplications the more efficacious, we ought to unite them in spirit to those of all fervent penitents and devout souls in invoking this advocate for sinners. End of section 36. Section 37 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. August 6, The Transfiguration of Our Lord. Our Divine Redeemer, being in Galilee about a year before his sacred passion, took with him St. Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, Saints James and John, and led them to a retired mountain. Tradition assures us that this was Mount Tabor, which is exceedingly high and beautiful, and was anciently covered with green trees and shrubs, and was very fruitful. It rises something like a sugar loaf in a vast plain in the middle of Galilee. This was the place in which the man God appeared in his glory. Whilst Jesus prayed, he suffered that glory which was always due to his sacred humility, and of which, for our sake, he deprived it to diffuse a ray over his whole body. His face was altered and shone as the sun, and his garments became white as snow. Moses and Elias were seen by the three apostles in his company on this occasion, and were heard discoursing with him on the death which he was to suffer in Jerusalem. The three apostles were wonderfully delighted with this glorious vision, and St. Peter cried out to Christ, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tents, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. Whilst St. Peter was speaking, there came, on a sudden, a bright shining cloud from heaven, an emblem of the presence of God's majesty, and from out of this cloud was heard a voice which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. The apostles that were present, 
upon hearing this voice, were seized with a sudden fear and fell upon the ground. But Jesus, going to them, touched them and bade them to rise. They immediately did so and saw no one but Jesus standing in his ordinary state. This vision happened in the night. As they went down the mountain early the next morning, Jesus bade them not to tell anyone what they had seen till he should be risen from the dead. Reflection From the contemplation of this glorious mystery, we ought to conceive a true idea of future happiness. If this once possess our souls, we will think nothing of any difficulties or labors we can meet with here, but regard with great indifference all the goods and evils of this life, provided we can but secure our portion in the kingdom of God's glory. End of section 37「Section 38 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gumary Shea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. August 7th, St. Cachetan. Cachetan was born at Vincenza in 1480, of pious and noble parents, who dedicated him to our Blessed Lady. From childhood he was known as the Saint, and in later years as the Hunter of Souls. A distinguished student, he left his native town to seek obscurity in Rome, but was there forced to accept office at the court of Julius II. On the death of that pontiff he returned to Vicenza, and disgusted his relatives by joining the confraternity of St. Jerome, whose members were drawn from the lowest classes. While he spent his fortune in building hospitals, and devoted himself to nursing the plague-stricken, to renew the lives of the clergy, he instituted the first community of regular clerks, known as Theatines. They devoted themselves to preaching the administration of the sacraments and the careful performance of the church's rites and ceremonies. St. Cajetan was the first to introduce the forty hours adoration of the Blessed Sacrament as an antidote to the heresy of Calvin. He had a most tender love for our Blessed Lady and his piety was rewarded, for one Christmas Eve she placed the infant Jesus in his arms. When the Germans under the constable Bourbon sacked Rome, St. Cachetan was barbarously scourged to extort from him riches which he had long before securely stored in heaven. When St. Cachetan was on his deathbed, resigned to the will of God, eager for pain to satisfy his love, and for death to attain to life. He beheld the mother of God, radiant with splendor and surrounded by ministering seraphim. In profound veneration he said, Lady, bless me. Mary replied, Kashitan, receive the blessing of my son, and know that I am here as a reward for the sincerity of your love, and to lead you to paradise. She then exhorted him to patience in fighting an evil spirit, who troubled him, and gave orders to the choirs of angels to escort his soul in triumph to heaven. Then turning her countenance, full of majesty and sweetness upon him, she said, Kashitan, my son calls thee, let us go in peace. Worn out with toil and sickness, he went to his reward in 1547. Reflection Imitate St. Kashitan's devotion to our blessed lady by invoking her aid before every work. End of section 38 Section 39 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. August 8th St. Syriacus and His Companions Martyrs St. Syriacus was a holy deacon at Rome, under the popes Marcellinus and Marcellus. In the persecution of Diocletian in 303, he was crowned with a glorious martyrdom in that city. With him suffered also Largus and Samardus and twenty others. Their bodies were first buried near the place of their execution, on the Solarian Way but were soon after removed to a farm on the devout Lady Lucina on the Ostian Road, 
on the eighth day of august reflection to honor the martyrs and duly celebrate their festivals we must learn their spirit and study to imitate them according to the circumstances of our state we must like them resist evil must subdue our passions suffer afflictions with patience and bear with others without murmuring or complaining the cross is the ladder by which we must ascend to heaven blessed peter favre born a d fifteen o six of poor savoyard shepherds peter at his earnest request was sent to school and in after years to the university of paris his college friends were saint ignatius of loyola and saint francis xavier ignatius found the young man's heart ready for his thoughts of apostolic zeal peter became his first companion and in the year of england's revolt was ordained the first priest of the new society of jesus from that day to the close of his life he was ever in the van of the church's struggle with falsehood and sin boldly facing heresy in germany he labored not less diligently to rouse up the dormant faith and charity of catholic courts and catholic lands the odor of blessed peter's virtues drew after him into religion the duke of gandia francis borgia and a young student of nimegin peter canisius both to become saints like their master the pope paul the third had chosen blessed favre to be his theologian at the council of trent and king john the third of portugal wished to send him as patriarch and apostle into abyssinia sick and worn with labor but obedient unto death the father hastened back to rome where his last illness came upon him he died in his fortieth year as one would wish to die in the very arms of his best friend and spiritual father st ignatius reflection as the body sinks under fatigue unless supported by food so external works however holy wear out the soul which is not regularly nourished by prayer in the most crowded day we can make time briefly and secretly to lift our soul to god and draw new strength from him end of section thirty nine Section 40 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. August 9th. St. Romanus, Martyr. St. Romanus was a soldier in Rome at the time of the martyrdom of St. Lawrence. Seeing the joy and constancy with which the holy martyr suffered his torments, he was moved to embrace the faith and addressing himself to St. Lawrence, was instructed and baptized by him in prison. Confessing aloud what he had done, he was arraigned, condemned, and beheaded the day before the martyrdom of St. Lawrence. Thus he arrived at his crown before his guide and master. The body of St. Romanus was first buried on the road to Tiber, but his remains were translated to Lucca, where they are kept under the high altar of a beautiful church which bears his name reflection we are bound to glorify god by our lives and christ commands that our good works shine before men it was the usual saying of the apostle saint matthias the faithful sins if his neighbor sins such ought to be the zeal of every one to instruct and edify his neighbor by word and example end of section forty Section 41 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. August 10th. St. Lawrence, Martyr. St. Lawrence was the chief among the seven deacons of the Roman Church. In the year 258, Pope Sixtus was led out to die, and St. Lawrence stood by, weeping that he could not share his fate. I was your minister, he said, when you consecrated the blood of our Lord. Why do you leave me behind now that you are about to shed your own? The holy pope comforted him with the words, Do not weep, my son. In three days you will follow me. This prophecy came true. 
the prefect of the city knew the rich offerings which the christians put into the hands of the clergy and he demanded the treasures of the roman church from lawrence their guardian the saint promised at the end of three days to show him riches exceeding all the wealth of the empire and set about collecting the poor the infirm and the religious who lived by the alms of the faithful he then bade the prefect see the treasures of the church christ whom lawrence had served in his poor gave him strength in the conflict which ensued roasted over a slow fire he made sport of his pains i am done enough he said eat if you will at length christ the father of the poor received him into eternal habitations god showed by the glory which shone around st lawrence the value he set upon his love for the poor prayers innumerable were granted at his tomb and he continued from his throne in heaven his charity to those in need granting them as st augustine says the smaller graces which they sought and leading them to the desire of better gifts reflection our lord appears before us in the persons of the poor charity to them is a great sign of predestination it is almost impossible the holy fathers assure us for any one who is charitable to the poor for christ's sake to perish End of section 41section forty two of little pictorial lives of the saints by john gilmary shea this librivox recording is in the public domain august eleventh saints tibertius and susanna martyrs agrestius chromatius was vicar to the prefect of rome and had condemned several martyrs in the reign of carinus and in the first years of diocletian saint tranquillinius being brought before him assured him that having been afflicted with the gout he had recovered a perfect state of health by being baptized chromatius was troubled by the same distemper and being convinced by this miracle of the truth of the gospel sent for a priest and receiving the sacrament of baptism was freed from that corporal infirmity chromatius's son tibertius was ordained subdeacon and was soon after betrayed to the persecutors condemned to many torments and at length beheaded on the lavican road three miles from rome where a church was afterward built his father chromatius retiring into the country lived there concealed in the fervent practice of all christian virtues saint susanna was nobly born in rome and is said to have been niece to pope caius having made a vow of virginity she refused to marry on which account she was impeached as a christian and suffered with heroic constancy a cruel martyrdom saint susanna suffered toward the beginning of diocletian's reign about the year two ninety five reflection sufferings were to the martyrs the most distinguishing mercy extraordinary graces and sources of the greatest crowns and glory all afflictions which god sends are in like manner the greatest mercies and blessings they are the most precious talents to be improved by us to the increasing of our love and affection to god and the exercise of the most heroic virtues of self-denial patience humility resignation and penance end of section forty two section forty three of the little pictorial lives of the saints by john gilmary shea this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. August 12th. St. Clair, Abbas. On Palm Sunday, March 17th, 1212, the Bishop of Assisi left the altar to present a palm to a noble maiden, eighteen years of age, whom bashfulness had detained in her place. This maiden was St. Clair. Already she had learnt from St. Francis to hate the world. And was secretly resolved to live for god alone the same night she escaped with one companion to the church of the portiuncula where she was met by saint francis and his brethren at the altar of our lady saint francis cut off her hair clothed her in his habit of penance a piece of sackcloth with his cord as a girdle 
thus was she espoused to christ in a miserable house outside assisi she founded her order and was joined by her sister fourteen years of age and afterwards by her mother and other noble ladies they went barefoot observed perpetual abstinence constant silence and perfect poverty while the saracen army of frederick the second was ravaging the valley of spoleto a body of infidels advanced to assault st clair's convent which stood outside assisi the saint caused the blessed sacrament to be placed in a monstrance above the gate of the monastery facing the enemy and kneeling before it prayed deliver not to be so lord the souls of those who confess to thee a voice from the host replied my protection will never fail you a sudden panic seized the infidel host which took to flight and the saint's convent was spared during her illness of twenty-eight years the holy eucharist was her only support and spinning linen for the altar the only work of her hands she died a d twelve fifty three as the passion was being read and our lady and the angels conducted her to glory reflection in a luxurious and effeminate age the daughters of st clair still bear the noble title of poor and preach by their daily lives the poverty of jesus christ end of section forty three section forty four of little pictorial lives of the saints by john gilmary shea this librivox recording is in the public domain august thirteenth st radegundes queen st radegundes was the daughter of a king of thuringia who was assassinated by his brother a war ensuing our saint at the age of twelve was made prisoner and carried captive by clotaire king of sosoins who had her instructed in the christian religion and baptized the great mysteries of our faith made such an impression on her tender soul that she gave herself to god with her whole heart and desired to consecrate to him her virginity she was obliged at last however to yield to the king's wish that she should become his wife as a great queen she continued no less an enemy to sloth and vanity than she was before and divided her time chiefly between her oratory the church and the care of the poor she also kept long fasts and during lent wore a haircloth under her rich garments clotaire was at first pleased with her devotions and allowed her full liberty in them but afterward used frequently to reproach her for her pious exercises saying he had married a nun rather than a queen who converted his court into a monastery seeing that clotaire was inflamed by bad passions our saint asked and obtained his leave to retire from court she went to noyon and was consecrated deaconess by saint medard radegundes first withdrew to size and soon after she went to potier and there built a great monastery she had a holy virgin named agnes made the first abbess and paid to her an implicit obedience in all things not reserving to herself the disposal of the least thing king clotaire repenting of his evil conduct wished her to return to court but through the intercession of st germanus of paris she was allowed to remain in her retirement where she died on the thirteenth of august five eighty seven end of section forty four section forty five of little pictorial lives of the saints by john gilmary shea this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. August 14th, St. Eusebius, Priest The Church celebrates this day the memory of St. Eusebius, who opposed the Arians at Rome with so much zeal. He was imprisoned in his room by order of the Emperor Constantius, and sanctified his captivity by constant prayer. Another saint of the same name, a priest and martyr, is commemorated on this day in the reign of diocletian and maximian before they had published any new edicts against the christians eusebius a holy priest a man eminently endowed with the spirit of prayer and all apostolical virtues suffered death for the faith probably in palestine 
the emperor maximian happening to be in that country complaint was made to maxentius president of the province that eusebius distinguished himself by his zeal in invoking and preaching christ and the holy man was seized maximian was by birth a barbarian and one of the roughest and most brutal and savage of all men yet the undaunted and modest virtue of this stranger set off by a heavenly grace struck him with awe he desired to save the servant of christ but like pilate would not give himself any trouble or hazard incurring the displeasure of those whom on all other occasions he despised maxentius commanded eusebius to sacrifice to the gods and on the saint refusing the president condemned him to be beheaded eusebius hearing the sentence pronounced said aloud i thank your goodness and praise your power o lord jesus christ that by calling me to the trial of my fidelity you have treated me as one of yours he at that instant heard a voice from heaven saying to him if you had not been found worthy to suffer you could not be admitted into the court of christ or to the seats of the just being come to the place of execution he knelt down and his head was struck off reflection let us learn from the example of the saints courage in the service of god he calls upon us to endure suffering of body and of mind if it is necessary to prove our fidelity to him and he promises to support us by his strength his light and his heavenly consolation end of section forty five Section 46 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. August 15th, the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary. On this festival, the Church commemorates the happy departure from life of the Blessed Virgin Mary and her translation into the kingdom of her Son, in which she received from him a crown of immortal glory and a throne above all the other saints and heavenly spirits after christ as the triumphant conqueror of death and hell ascended into heaven his blessed mother remained at jerusalem persevering in prayer with the disciples till with them she had received the holy ghost she lived to a very advanced age but finally paid the common debt of nature none among the children of adam being exempt from that rigorous law but the death of the saints is rather to be called a sweet sleep than death much more that the queen of saints who had been exempt from all sin it is a traditionary pious belief that the body of the blessed virgin was raised by god soon after her death and taken up to glory by a singular privilege before the general resurrection of the dead the assumption of the blessed virgin mary is the greatest of all the festivals which the church celebrates in her honor it is the consummation of all the other great mysteries by which her life was rendered most wonderful it is the birthday of her true greatness and glory and the crowning of all the virtues of her whole life which we admire single in her other festivals reflection whilst we contemplate in profound sentiments of veneration astonishment and praise the glory to which mary is raised by her triumph on this day we ought for our own advantage to consider by what means she arrived at the sublime degree of honor and happiness that we may walk in her steps no other way is open to us the same path which conducted her to glory will also lead us thither we shall be partners in her reward if we copy her virtues end of section forty six section forty seven of little pictorial lives of the saints by john gilmary shea this librivox recording is in the public domain august sixteenth saint hyacinth hyacinth the glorious apostle of poland and russia was born of noble parents in poland about the year eleven eighty five in twelve eighteen being already canon of krakow he accompanied his uncle the bishop of that place to rome there he met St. Dominic, and received the habit of the friar preachers from the patriarch himself, of whom he became a living copy. So wonderful was his progress in virtue, 
that within a year dominic sent him to preach and plant the order in poland where he founded two houses his apostolic journeys extended over numerous regions austria bohemia livonia the shores of the black sea tartary and northern china on the east and sweden and norway to the west were evangelized by him and he is said to have visited scotland everywhere multitudes were converted churches and convents were built one hundred and twenty thousand pagans and infidels were baptized by his hands he worked numerous miracles and at krakow raised a dead youth to life he had inherited from saint dominic a most filial confidence in the mother of god to her he ascribed his success and to her aid he looked for his salvation when saint hyacinth was at kiev the tartars sacked the town but it was only as he finished mass that the saint heard of the danger without waiting to invest he took the ciborium in his hands and was leaving the church as he passed by an image of mary a voice said hyacinth my son why dost thou leave me behind take me with thee and leave me not to mine enemies the statue was heavy alabaster but when hyacinth took it into his arms it was light as a reed with the blessed sacrament and the image he came to the river dnieper and walked dry shod over the surface of the waters on the eve of the assumption he was warned of his coming death in spite of a wasting fever he celebrated mass on the feast and communicated as a dying man he was anointed at the foot of the altar and died the same day a d twelve fifty seven reflection st hyacinth teaches us to employ every effort in the service of god and to rely for success not on our own industry but on the prayer of his immaculate mother and of section forty seven section forty eight of little pictorial lives of the saints by john gilmary shea this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. August 17th, St. Liberatus, abbot, and six monks, martyrs. Huneric, the Arian Vandal king in Africa, in the seventh year of his reign, published fresh edicts against the Catholics, and ordered their monasteries to be everywhere demolished. Seven monks, named Liberatus, Boniface, Servus, Rusticus, Rogatus, Septimus, and Maximus, who lived in a monastery near Capsa, in the province of Byzacena, were at that time summoned to Carthage. They were first tempted with great promises, but as they remained constant in the belief of the Trinity, and of one baptism, they were loaded with irons and thrown into a dark dungeon. The faithful, having bribed the guards, visited the saints day and night, to be instructed by them and mutually to encourage one another to suffer for the faith of christ the king learning this commanded them to be more closely confined loaded with heavier irons and tortured with a cruelty never heard of till that time soon after he condemned them to be put into an old ship and burnt at sea the martyrs walked cheerfully to the shore contemning the insults of the arians as they passed along Particular endeavors were used by the persecutors to gain Maximus, who was very young, but God, who makes the tongues of children eloquent to praise his name, gave him strength to withstand all their efforts, and he boldly told them that they should never be able to separate him from his holy abbot and brethren, with whom he had borne the labors of a penitential life for the sake of everlasting glory. An old vessel was filled with dry sticks, and the seven martyrs were put on board and bound on the wood the fire was put to it several times but it went out immediately and all endeavors to kindle it were in vain the tyrant in rage and confusion gave orders that the martyrs brains should be dashed out with oars which was done and their bodies cast into the sea which threw them all on the shore the catholics interred them honorably in the monastery of bigua near the church of st celerinus they suffered in the year 483 reflection let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or a railer or a coveter of other men's things but if as a christian let him not be ashamed but let him glorify god in that name 
End of section 48. Section 49 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. August 18th. St. Helena, Empress. St. Agapetus, Martyr. It was the pious boast of the city of Colchester, England, for many ages, that St. Helena was born within its walls. And though this honor has been disputed, it is certain that she was a British princess. She embraced Christianity late in life, but her incomparable faith and piety greatly influenced her son Constantine, the first Christian emperor, and served to kindle a holy zeal in the hearts of the Roman people. Forgetful of her high dignity, she delighted to assist at the divine office amid the poor, and by her alms deeds showed herself a mother to the indigent and distressed. In her eightieth year she made a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, with the ardent desire of discovering the cross on which our blessed Redeemer suffered. After many labors, three crosses were found on Mount Calvary, together with the nails and the inscription recorded by the evangelist. It still remained to identify the true cross of our Lord. By the advice of the bishop Macarius, the three were applied successively to a woman afflicted with an incurable disease and no sooner had the third touched her than she arose, perfectly healed. The pious empress, transported with joy, built a most glorious church on Mount Calvary to receive the precious relic, sending portions of it to Rome and Constantinople, where they were solemnly exposed to the adoration of the faithful. In the year 312, Constantine found himself attacked by Maxentius with vastly superior forces, and the very existence of his empire threatened. In this crisis he bethought him of the crucified Christian God whom his mother Helena worshipped, and kneeling down, prayed God to reveal himself and give him the victory. Suddenly, at noonday, a cross of fire was seen by his army in the calm and cloudless sky, and beneath it the words, In hoc signo vinces, Through this sign thou shalt conquer. By divine command, Constantine made a standard like the cross he had seen, which was borne at the head of his troops, and under this Christian ensign they marched against the enemy and obtained a complete victory. Shortly after, Helena herself returned to Rome, where she expired, A.D. 328. St. Agapetus suffered in his youth a cruel martyrdom at Praeneste, now called Palestrina, twenty-four miles from Rome, under Aurelian, about the year 275. His name is famous in the ancient calendars of the Church of Rome. Two churches in Palestrina and others in other places are dedicated to God under his name. Reflection St. Helena thought it the glory of her life to find the cross of Christ and to raise a temple in its honor. How many Christians in these days are ashamed to make this life-giving sign and to confess themselves the followers of the crucified. End of section 49section fifty of little pictorial lives of the saints by john gilmary shea this librivox recording is in the public domain august nineteenth st louis bishop this saint was little nephew to st louis king of france and nephew by his mother to st elizabeth of hungary he was born at brignoles in provence in twelve seventy four he was a saint from the cradle and from his childhood made it his earnest study to do nothing which was not directed to the divine service, and with a view only to eternity. Even his recreations he referred to this end, and chose only such as were serious and seemed barely necessary for the exercise of the body and preserving the vigor of the mind. His walks usually led him to some church or religious house, it was his chief delight to hear the servants of God discourse on mortification or the most perfect practices of piety. His modesty and recollection in the church inspired with devotion all who saw him. When he was only seven years old, his mother found him often lying in the night 
on a mat which was spread on the floor near his bed which he did out of an early spirit of penance in twelve eighty four our saint's father charles the second then prince of salerno was taken prisoner in a sea fight by the king of aragon who was only released on condition that he sent into aragon as hostages fifty gentlemen and three of his sons one of whom was our saint louis was set at liberty in twelve ninety four by a treaty concluded between the king of naples his father and james the second king of aragon one condition of which was the marriage of his sister blanche with the king of aragon both courts had at the same time extremely at heart the project of a double marriage and that the princess of majorca sister to king james of aragon should be married to louis but the saint's resolution of dedicating himself to god was inflexible and he resigned his right to the crown of naples which he begged his father to confer on his next brother robert the opposition of his family obliged the superiors of the friar minors to refuse for some time to admit him into their body wherefore he took holy orders at naples the pious pope saint celestine had nominated him archbishop of lyon in twelve ninety four but as he had not then taken the tonsure he found means to defeat that project boniface the eighth gave him a dispensation to receive priestly orders in the twenty-third year of his age and afterwards sent him a like dispensation for the episcopal character together with his nomination to the archbishopric of toulouse and a severe injunction in virtue of holy obedience to accept the same however he first made his religious profession among the friar minors on christmas eve twelve ninety six and received the episcopal consecration in the beginning of the february following he travelled to his bishopric as a poor religious but was received at toulouse with the veneration due to a saint and the magnificence that became a prince his modesty mildness and devotion inspired a love of piety in all who beheld him it was his first care to provide for the relief of the indigent and his first visits were made to the hospitals and the poor in his apostolical labors he abated nothing of his austerities said mass every day and preached frequently being obliged to go into provence for certain very urgent ecclesiastical affairs he fell sick at the castle of brignoles finding his end draw near he received the viaticum on his knees melting in tears and in his last moments ceased not to repeat the hail mary he died on the nineteenth of august twelve ninety seven being only twenty three years and six months old End of section fifty section fifty one of little pictorial lives of the saints by john gilmary shea this librivox recording is in the public domain august twentieth st bernard bernard was born at the castle of fontaines in burgundy the grace of his person and the vigour of his intellect filled his parents with the highest hopes and the world lay bright and smiling before him when he renounced it for ever and joined the monks of citeaux all his brothers followed bernard to citeaux except nivard the youngest who was left to be the stay of his father in his old age you will now be heir of everything said they to him as they departed yes said the boy you leave me earth and keep heaven for yourselves do you call that fair and he too left the world at length their aged father came to exchange wealth and honour for the poverty of a monk of clairvaux only one sister remained behind she was married and loved the world and its pleasures magnificently dressed she visited bernard he refused to see her and only at last consented to do so not as her brother but as the minister of christ the words he then spoke moved her so much that two years later she retired to a convent with her husband's consent and died in the reputation of sanctity bernard's holy example attracted so many novices that other monasteries were erected and our saint was appointed abbot of that of clairvaux unsparing with himself he at first expected too much of his brethren who were disheartened at his severity but soon perceiving his error 
he led them forward by the sweetness of his correction and the mildness of his rule to wonderful perfection in spite of his desire to lie hid the fame of his sanctity spread far and wide and many churches asked for him as their bishop through the help of pope eugenius the third his former subject he escaped this dignity yet his retirement was continually invaded the poor and the weak sought his protection bishops kings and popes applied to him for advice and at length eugenius himself charged him to preach the crusade by his fervor eloquence and miracles bernard kindled the enthusiasm of christendom and two splendid armies were dispatched against the infidel their defeat was only due said the saint to their own sins bernard died a d eleven fifty three his most precious writings have earned for him the titles of the last of the fathers and a doctor of holy church reflection st bernard used to say to those who applied for admission to the monastery if you desire to enter here leave at the threshold the body you have brought with you from the world here there is room only for your soul let us constantly ask ourselves st bernard's daily question to what end didst thou come hither End of section 51。section 52 of little pictorial lives of the saints by john gilmary shea。this librivox recording is in the public domain。august 21st。saint jane francis de chantal。at the age of 16, jane francis de fremyot。already a motherless child。was placed under the care of a worldly-minded governess in this crisis she offered herself to the mother of god and secured mary's protection for life when a protestant sought her hand she steadily refused to marry an enemy of god and his church and shortly afterward as the loving and beloved wife of the baron de chantal made her house the pattern of a christian home but god had marked for her something higher than domestic sanctity two children and a dearly beloved sister died and in the full tide of prosperity her husband's life was taken by the innocent hand of a friend for seven years the sorrows of her widowhood were increased by ill usage from servants and inferiors and the cruel importunities of friends who urged her to marry again harassed almost to despair by their entreaties she branded on her heart the name of jesus and in the end left her beloved home and children to live for god alone it was on the nineteenth of march sixteen o nine that madame de chantal bade farewell to her family and relations pale and with tears in her eyes she passed round the large room sweetly and humbly taking leave of each her son a boy of fifteen used every entreaty every endearment to induce his mother not to leave them and at last passionately flung himself across the door of the room in an agony of distress she passed on over the body of her son to the embrace of her aged and disconsolate father the anguish of that parting reached its height when kneeling at the foot of the venerable old man she sought and obtained his last blessing promising to repay in her new home his sacrifice by her prayers well might st francis call her the valiant woman she was to found with st francis de sales a great order sickness opposition want beset her and the death of her children friends and of st francis himself followed while eighty-seven houses of the visitation rose under her hand nine long years of interior desolation completed the work of god's grace and in her seventieth year st vincent de paul saw at the moment of her death her soul ascend as a ball of fire to heaven reflection profit by the successive trials of life to gain the strength and courage of st jane francis and they will become stepping stones from earth to heaven end of section fifty two section fifty three of little pictorial lives of the saints by john gilmary shea this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. August 22nd. St. Symphorian, Martyr. About the year 180, there was a great procession of the heathen goddess Ceres at Autun in France, 
amongst the crowd was one who refused to pay the ordinary marks of worship he was therefore dragged before the magistrate and accused of sacrilege and sedition when asked his name and condition he replied my name is symphorian i am a christian he came of a noble and christian family he was still young and so innocent that he was said to converse with the holy angels the christians of autun were few and little known and the judge could not believe that the youth was serious in his purpose he caused the laws enforcing heathen worship to be read and looked for a speedy compliance symphorian replied that he must obey the laws of the king of kings give me a hammer he said and i will break your idol in pieces he was scourged and thrown into a dungeon some days later the sun of light came forth from the darkness of his prison haggard and worn but full of joy he despised the riches and honors offered to him as he had despised torments he died by the sword and went to the court of the heavenly king the mother of saint symphorian stood on the city walls and saw her son let out to die she knew the honors he had refused and the dishonor of his death but she esteemed the reproach of christ better than all the riches of egypt and she cried out to him my son my son keep the living god in your heart look up to him who reigns in heaven thus she shared in the glory of his passion and her name lives with his in the records of the church little more than a century later the roman empire bowed before the faith of christ many miracles spread the glory of saint symphorian and of christ the king of saints reflection the catholic religion teaches us to be subject to every rightful authority but no heavenly authority has any right against christ and his church we are accused of sedition or disobedience because we are faithful to our religion then we must choose as saint symphorian chose and obey god rather than man end of section fifty three Section 54 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. August 23rd, St. Philip Benezi. St. Philip Benezi was born in Florence on the Feast of the Assumption, 1233. That same day the Order of Servites was founded by the Mother of God. As an infant at the breast, Philip broke out into speech at the sight of these new religious and begged his mother to give them alms amidst all the temptations of his youth he longed to become himself a servant of mary and it was only the fear of his own unworthiness which made him yield to his father's wish and begin to practise medicine after long and weary waiting his doubts were solved by our lady herself who in a vision bade him enter her order still philip dared only offer himself as a lay brother and in this humble state he strove to do penance for his sins in spite of his reluctance he was promoted to the post of master of novices and as his rare abilities were daily discovered he was bidden to prepare for the priesthood thenceforth honors were heaped upon him he became general of the order and only escaped by flight elevation to the papal throne his preaching restored peace to italy which was wasted by civil wars and at the council of lyon he spoke to the assembled prelates with a gift of tongues amid all these favors philip lived in extreme penitence constantly examining his soul before the judgment seat of god and condemning himself as only fit for hell saint philip though he was free from the stain of mortal sin was never weary of beseeching god's mercy from the time he was ten years old he said daily the penitential psalms on his deathbed he kept reciting the verses of the miserere with his cheeks streaming with tears and during his agony he went through a terrible contest to overcome the fear of damnation but a few minutes before he died all his doubts disappeared and were succeeded by a holy trust he uttered the responses in a low but audible voice and when at last the mother of god appeared before him he lifted up his arms with joy and breathed a gentle sigh as if placing his soul in her hand he died on the octave of the assumption twelve eighty five reflection endeavor so to act as you would wish to have acted when you stand before your judge 
this is the rule of the saints and the only safe rule for all end of section fifty four section fifty five of little pictorial lives of the saints by john gilmary shea this librivox recording is in the public domain august twenty four st bartholomew apostle st bartholomew was one of the twelve who were called to the apostolate of our blessed lord himself several learned interpreters of the holy scripture take this apostle to have been the same as nathaniel a native of cana in galilee a doctor in the jewish law and one of the seventy-two disciples of christ to whom he was conducted by saint philip and whose innocence and simplicity of heart deserve to be celebrated with the highest eulogium by the divine mouth of our redeemer he is mentioned among the disciples who were met together in prayer after christ's ascension and he received the holy ghost with the rest being eminently qualified by the divine grace to discharge the functions of an apostle he carried the gospel through the most barbarous countries of the east penetrating into the remoter indies he then returned again into the northwest part of asia and met st philip at Heropolis in phrygia hence he travelled into laconia where he instructed the people in the christian faith but we know not even the names of many of the countries in which he preached st bartholomew's last removal was into great armenia where preaching in a place obstinately addicted to the worship of idols he was crowned with a glorious martyrdom the modern greek historians say that he was condemned by the governor of albanopolis to be crucified others affirm that he was flayed alive which might well enough consist with his crucifixion this double punishment being in use not only in egypt but also among the persians reflection the characteristic virtue of the apostles was zeal for the divine glory the first property of the love of god a soldier is always ready to defend the honor of his prince and a son that of his father and can a christian say he loves god who is indifferent to his honor end of section fifty five Section 56 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. August 25th, St. Louis, King. The mother of Louis told him she would rather see him die than commit a mortal sin, and he never forgot her words. King of France at the age of twelve, he made the defense of God's honor the aim of his life before two years he had crushed the albigensian heretics and forced them by stringent penalties to respect the catholic faith amidst the cares of government he daily recited the divine office and heard two masses and the most glorious churches in france are still monuments of his piety when his courtiers remonstrated with louis for his law that blasphemies should be branded on the lips he replied i would willingly have my own lips branded to root out blasphemy from my kingdom the fearless protector of the weak and the oppressed he was chosen to arbitrate in all the great feuds of his age between the pope and the emperor between henry the third and the english barons in twelve forty eight to rescue the land which christ had trod he gathered round him the chivalry of france and embarked for the east there before the infidel in victory or defeat on the bed of sickness or a captive in chains louis showed himself ever the same the first the best and the bravest of christian knights when a captive at damietta an emir rushed into his tent brandishing a dagger red with the blood of the sultan and threatened to stab him also unless he would make him a knight as the emperor frederick had Fakardin. louis calmly replied that no unbeliever could perform the duties of a christian knight in the same captivity he was offered his liberty on terms lawful in themselves but enforced by an oath which implied a blasphemy and though the infidels held their swords points at his throat and threatened a massacre of the christians louis inflexibly refused the death of his mother recalled him to france and when order was re-established he again set forth on a second crusade in august twelve seventy his army landed at tunis and though victorious over the enemy 
succumbed to a malignant fever. Louis was one of the victims. He received the viaticum kneeling by his bed camp, and gave up his life with the same joy that he had given all else for the honor of God. Reflection. If we cannot imitate St. Louis in dying for the honor of God, we can at least resemble him in resenting the blasphemies offered against God by the infidel, the heretic, and the scoffer. End of section 56section fifty seven of little pictorial lives of the saints by john gilmary shea this LibriVox recording is in the public domain august twenty sixth saint zephrinus pope and martyr saint zephrinus a native of rome succeeded victor in the pontificate in the year two o two in which severus raised the fifth most bloody persecution against the church which continued not for two years only, but until the death of that emperor in 211. Under this furious storm, this holy pastor was the support and comfort of the distressed flock of Christ, and he suffered by charity and compassion what every confessor underwent. The triumphs of the martyrs were indeed his joy, but his heart received many deep wounds from the fall of apostates and heretics neither did this latter affliction cease when peace was restored to the church our saint had also the affliction to see the fall of tertullian which seems to have been owing partly to his pride eusebius tells us that this holy pope exerted his zeal so strenuously against the blasphemies of the heretics that they treated him in the most contumelious manner but it was his glory that they called him the principal defender of christ's divinity St. Zephrinus filled the pontifical chair seventeen years, dying in 219. He was buried in his own cemetery on the 26th of August. He is, in some martyrologies, styled a martyr, which title he might deserve by what he suffered in the persecution, though he perhaps did not die by the executioner. Reflection God has always raised up holy pastors zealous to maintain the faith of his church inviolable, and to watch over the purity of its morals and the sanctity of its discipline. We enjoy the greatest advantages of the divine grace through their labors, and we owe to God a tribute of perpetual thanksgiving and immortal praise for all those mercies which he has afforded his church on earth. End of section 57 Section 58 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. August 27th. St. Joseph Calasantius. St. Joseph Calasantius was born in Aragon, A.D. 1556. When only five years old, he led a troop of children through the streets to find the devil and kill him. He became a priest and was engaged in various reforms when he heard a voice saying, Go to Rome, and had a vision of many children who were being taught by him and by a company of angels. When he reached the holy city, his heart was moved by the vice and ignorance of the children of the poor. Their need mastered his humility, and he founded the order of clerks regular of the pious schools. He himself provided all that was necessary for the education of the children receiving nothing from them in payment, and there were soon about a thousand scholars of every rank under his care. Each lesson began with prayer. Every half hour, devotion was renewed by acts of faith, hope, and charity, and towards the end of school time, the children were instructed in the Christian doctrine. They were then escorted home by the masters, so as to escape all harm by the way. But enemies arose against Joseph from among his own subjects. They accused him to the holy office, and at the age of eighty-six he was led through the streets to prison. At last the order was reduced to a simple congregation, was not restored to its former privileges till after the saint's death, yet he died full of hope. My work, he said, was done solely for the love of God. Reflection My children, said the curé of ours, 
i often think that most of the christians who are lost are lost for want of instruction they do not know their religion well End of section 58. Section 59 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. August 28th, St. Augustine of Hippo. St. Augustine was born in 354 at Tagaste in Africa. He was brought up in the Christian faith but without receiving baptism an ambitious schoolboy of brilliant talents and violent passions he early lost both his faith and his innocence he persisted in his irregular life until he was thirty-two being then at milan professing rhetoric he tells us that the faith of his childhood had regained possession of his intellect but that he could not as yet resolve to break the chains of evil habit one day however stung to the heart by the account of some sudden conversions he cried out the unlearned rise and storm heaven and we with all our learning for lack of heart lie wallowing here he then withdrew into a garden when a long and terrible conflict ensued suddenly a young fresh voice he knows not whose breaks in upon his strife with the words take and read and he lights upon the passage beginning walk honestly as in the day the battle was won he received baptism returned home and gave all to the poor at hippo where he settled he was consecrated bishop in three ninety five for thirty-five years he was the centre of ecclesiastical life in africa and the church's mightiest champion against heresy whilst his writings have been everywhere accepted as one of the principal sources of devotional thought and theological speculation he died in 430. Reflection. Read the lives of the saints, and you will find that you are gradually creating a society about you to which in some measure you will be forced to raise the standard of your daily life. End of section 59. Section 60 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. August 29th, the beheading of St. John the Baptist. St. John the Baptist was called by God to be the forerunner of his divine son. In order to preserve his innocence spotless and to improve the extraordinary graces which he had received, he was directed by the Holy Ghost to lead an austere and contemplative life in the wilderness in the continual exercises of devout prayer and penance from his infancy till he was thirty years of age at this age the faithful minister began to discharge his mission clothed with the weeds of penance he announced to all men the obligation they lay under of washing away their iniquities with the tears of sincere compunction and proclaimed the messiah who was then coming to make his appearance among them he was received by the people as the true herald of the Most High God, and his voice was, as it were, a trumpet sounding from heaven to summon all men to avert the divine judgments and to prepare themselves to reap the benefit of the mercy that was offered them. The tetrarch Herod and Tippas, having, in defiance of all laws divine and human, married Herodias, the wife of his brother Philip, who was yet living. St. John the Baptist boldly reprehended the Tetrarch and his accomplice for so scandalous an incest and adultery, and Herod, urged on by lust and anger, cast the saint into prison. About a year after St. John had been made a prisoner, Herod gave a splendid entertainment to the nobility of Galilee. Salome, a daughter of Herodias by her lawful husband, pleased Herod by her dancing insomuch that he promised her to grant whatever she asked on this salome consulted with her mother what to ask herodias instructed her daughter to demand the death of john the baptist and persuaded the young damsel to make it part of her petition that the head of the prisoner should be forthwith brought to her in a dish this strange request startled the tyrant himself he assented however and sent a soldier of his guard to behead the saint in prison with an order to bring his head up in a charger 
and present it to Salome, who delivered it to her mother. St. Jerome relates that the furious Herodias made it her inhuman pastime to prick the sacred tongue with a bodkin. Thus died the great forerunner of our blessed Saviour, about two years and three months after his entrance upon his public ministry, about a year before the death of our blessed Redeemer. Reflection All the high graces with which St. John was favored sprang from his humility. In this all his other virtues were founded. If we desire to form ourselves upon so great a model, we must, above all things, labor to lay the same deep foundation. End of section 60section sixty one of little pictorial lives of the saints by john gilmary shea this librivox recording is in the public domain august thirtieth st rose of lima this lovely flower of sanctity the first canonized saint of the new world was born at lima in fifteen eighty six she was christened isabel but the beauty of her infant face earned for her the title of rose which she ever after bore as a child while still in the cradle, her silence under a painful surgical operation proved the thirst for suffering already consuming her heart. At an early age she took service to support her impoverished parents and worked for them day and night. In spite of hardships and austerities, her beauty ripened with increasing age, and she was much and openly admired. From fear of vanity she cut off her hair, blistered her face with pepper, and her hands with lime. For further security, she enrolled herself in the Third Order of St. Dominic, took St. Catherine of Siena as her model, and redoubled her penance. Her cell was a garden hut, her couch a box of broken tiles. Under her habit, Rose wore a hair shirt studded with iron nails, while, concealed by her veil, a silver crown armed with ninety points encircled her head. More than once, when she shuddered at the prospect of a night of torture, a voice said, My cross was yet more painful. The blessed sacrament seemed almost her only food. Her love for it was intense. When the Dutch fleet prepared to attack the town, Rose took her place before the tabernacle, and wept that she was not worthy to die in its defense. All her sufferings were offered for the conversion of sinners, and the thought of the multitudes in hell were ever before her soul. She died A.D. 1617, at the age of 31. Reflection Rose, pure as driven snow, was filled with deepest contrition and humility, and did constant and terrible penance. Our sins are continual, our repentance passing, our contrition slight, our penance nothing. How will it fare with us? St. Fiaker, Anchorite St. Fiaker was nobly born in Ireland, and had his education under the care of a bishop of eminent sanctity who was, according to some, Conan, bishop of Soder, or the Western Islands. Looking upon all worldly advantages as dross, he left his country and friends in the flower of his age, and with certain pious companions sailed over to France, in quest of some solitude in which he might devote himself to God unknown to the rest of the world. Divine Providence conducted him to St. Faro, who was the bishop of Meu, and eminent for sanctity. When St. Fiaker addressed himself to him, the prelate, charmed with the marks of extraordinary virtue and abilities which he discovered in this stranger, gave him a solitary dwelling in a forest called Breu, which was his own patrimony, two leagues from Meu. In this place the holy anchorite cleared the ground of trees and briars, made himself a cell or the small garden, and built an oratory in honor of the Blessed Virgin, in which he spent great part of the days and nights in devout prayer. He tilled his garden and labored with his own hands for his subsistence. The life he led was most austere, and only necessity or charity ever interrupted his exercises of prayer and heavenly contemplation. Many resorted to him for advice, and the poor for relief. But following an inviolable rule among the Irish monks, he never suffered any woman to enter the enclosure of his hermitage. 
St. Chillen, or Killian, an Irishman of high birth, on his return from Rome, visited St. Fiacre, who was his kinsman, and having passed some time under his discipline, was directed by his advice, with the authority of the bishops, to preach in that and the neighboring diocese. This commission he executed with admirable sanctity and fruit. St. Fiacre died about the year 670, on the 30th of August. Reflection Ye who love indolence, ponder well these words of St. Paul. If any man will not work, neither let him eat. End of section 61。section 62 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. August 31st, St. Raymond Nanatus. St. Raymond Nanatus was born in Catalonia in the year 1204, and was descended of a gentleman's family of a small fortune. In his childhood he seemed to find pleasure only in his devotions and serious duties. His father, perceiving in him an inclination to a religious state, took him from school and sent him to take care of a farm which he had in the country. Raymond readily obeyed, and in order to enjoy the opportunity of holy solitude, kept the sheep himself, and spent his time in the mountains and forests and holy meditation and prayer. Some time after he joined the new order of Our Lady of Mercy for the redemption of captives, and was admitted to his profession at Barcelona by the holy founder, St. Peter Nolasco. Within two or three years after his profession, he was sent into Barbary with a considerable sum of money, where he purchased at Algiers the liberty of a great number of slaves. When all this treasure was exhausted, he gave himself up as a hostage for the ransom of certain others. This magnanimous sacrifice served only to exasperate the Mohammedans, who treated him with uncommon barbarity, till, fearing lest if he died in their hands, they should lose the ransom which was to be paid for the slaves for whom he remained a hostage, they gave orders that he should be treated with more humanity. Hereupon he was permitted to go abroad about the streets, which liberty he made use of to comfort and encourage the Christians in their chains, and he converted and baptized some Mohammedans. For this the governor condemned him to be put to death by thrusting a stake into the body, but his punishment was commuted, and he underwent a cruel bastinato. This torment did not daunt his courage. So long as he saw souls in danger of perishing eternally, he thought he had yet done nothing. St. Raymond had no more money to employ in releasing poor captives, and to speak to a Mohammedan upon the subject of religion was death. He could, however, still exert his endeavors with hopes of some success, or of dying a martyr of charity. He therefore resumed his former method of instructing and exhorting both the Christians and the infidels. The governor, who was enraged, ordered our saint to be barbarously tortured, and imprisoned till his ransom was brought by some religious men of his order, who were sent with it by St. Peter. Upon his return to Spain, he was nominated cardinal by Pope Gregory the Ninth, and the Pope, being desirous to have so holy a man about his person, called him to Rome. The saint obeyed, but went no further than Cardona, when he was seized with a violent fever, which proved mortal. He died on the 31st of August, in the year 1240, the 37th of his age. Reflection. The saint gave not only his substance, but his liberty, and even exposed himself to the most cruel torments and death for the redemption of captives and the salvation of souls. But alas, do not we, merely to gratify our prodigality, vanity, or avarice, refuse to give the superfluous part of our possessions to the poor, who for want of it are perishing with cold and hunger? Let us remember that he that giveth to the poor shall not want. End of section 62 Section 63 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. September 1st St. Giles, Abbot. 
st giles whose name has been held in great veneration for several ages in france and england is said to have been an athenian by birth and of noble extraction his extraordinary piety and learning drew the admiration of the world upon him in such a manner that it was impossible for him to enjoy in his own country that obscurity and retirement which was the chief object of his desires on earth he therefore sailed to france and chose a hermitage first in the open deserts near the mouth of the rhone afterward near the river guard and lastly in a forest in the diocese of nismes he passed many years in this close solitude living on wild herbs or roots and water and conversing only with god we read in his life that he was for some time nourished with the milk of a hind in the forest which being pursued by hunters fled for refuge to the saint who was thus discovered the reputation of the sanctity of this holy hermit was much increased by many miracles which he wrought and which rendered his name famous throughout all france st giles was highly esteemed by the french king but could not be prevailed upon to forsake his solitude he however admitted several disciples and settled excellent discipline in the monastery of which he was the founder and which in succeeding ages became a flourishing abbey of the benedictine order reflection he who accompanies the exercises of contemplation and arduous penance with zealous and undaunted endeavors to conduct others to the same glorious term with himself shall be truly great in the kingdom of heaven end of section sixty three Section 64 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. September 2nd, St. Stephen, King. Geisa, fourth Duke of Hungary, was with his wife, converted to the faith, and saw in a vision the martyr St. Stephen, who told him that he should have a son who would perfect the work he had begun this son was born a d nine seventy seven and received the name of stephen he was most carefully educated and succeeded his father at an early age he began to root out idolatry suppressed a rebellion of his pagan subjects and founded monasteries and churches all over the land he sent to pope sylvester begging him to appoint bishops to the eleven sees he had endowed and to bestow on him for the greater success of his work the title of king the pope granted his request and sent him a cross to be borne before him saying that he regarded him as the true apostle of his people his devotion was fervent he placed his realms under the protection of our blessed lady and kept the feast of her assumption with peculiar affection he gave good laws and saw to their execution throughout his life we are told he had christ on his lips christ in his heart and christ in all he did his only wars were wars of defence and he was always successful god sent him many and sore trials one by one his children died but he bore all with perfect submission to the will of god when saint stephen was about to die he summoned the bishops and nobles and gave them charge concerning the choice of a successor then he urged them to nurture and cherish the catholic church which was still as a tender plant in hungary to follow justice humility and charity to be obedient to the laws and to show ever a reverent submission to the holy see then raising his eyes towards heaven he said o queen of heaven august restorer of a prostrate world to thy care i commend the holy church my people and my realm and my own departing soul and then on his favorite feast of the assumption a d ten thirty eight he died in peace our duty says father newman is to follow the vicar of christ whither he goes and never to desert him however we may be tried but to defend him at all hazards and against all comers as a son would a father and as a wife a husband knowing that his cause is the cause of god End of section 64.
Section 65 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. September 3rd. Saint Seraphia, Virgin and Martyr. Saint Seraphia was born at Antioch of Christian parents, who, flying from the persecutions of Adrian, went to Italy and settled there. Her parents dying, Seraphia was sought in marriage by many, but having resolved to consecrate herself to God alone, she sold all her possessions and distributed the proceeds to the poor. Finally, she sold herself into a voluntary slavery and entered the service of a Roman lady named Sabina. The piety of Seraphia, her love of work, and her charity soon gained the heart of her mistress, who was not long in becoming a Christian. Having been denounced as a follower of Christ, Seraphia was condemned to death. She was at first placed on a burning pile, but remained uninjured by the flames. Almost despairing of being able to inflict death upon her, the prefect Beryllus ordered her to be beheaded, and she thus received the crown which she so richly merited. Her mistress gathered her remains, and interred them with every mark of respect. Sabina, meeting with a martyr's death a year after, was laid in the same tomb with her faithful servant. As early as the fifth century there was a church at Rome placed under their invocation. Reflection Christian courage bears relation to our faith. We continue in the faith, grounded and settled and immovable. All things will be found possible to us. End of section 65Section 66 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. September 4th. St. Rosalia, Virgin. St. Rosalia was daughter of a noble family descended from Charlemagne. She was born at Palermo in Sicily, and despising in her youth worldly vanities, made herself an abode in a cave on Mount Pellegrino three miles from Palermo, where she completed the sacrifice of her heart to God by austere penance and manual labor, sanctified by assiduous prayer and the constant union of her soul with God. She died in 1160. Her body was found buried in a grot under the mountain in the year of the Jubilee, 1625, under Pope Urban VIII, and was translated into the Metropolitan Church of Palermo of which she was chosen a patroness to her patronage that island describes the ceasing of a grievous pestilence at the same time st rose of perturbo who was honored on this same day was born in the spring of twelve forty a time when frederick the second was oppressing the church and many were faithless to the holy see the infinite once seemed filled with grace with tottering steps she sought Jesus in his tabernacle. She knelt before sacred images. She listened to pious talk, retaining all she heard, and this when she was scarcely three years old. One coarse habit covered her flesh. Fasts and disciplines were her delight. To defend the church's rights was her burning wish, and for this she received her mission from the Mother of God, who gave her the Franciscan habit, with the command to go forth and preach. When hardly ten years old, Rose went down to the public square at Victorbo, called upon the inhabitants to be faithful to the sovereign pontiff, and vehemently denounced all his opponents. So great was the power of her word, and of the miracles which accompanied it, that the imperial party, in fear and anger, drove her from the city, but she continued to preach till Innocent the Fourth was brought back in triumph to Rome, and the cause of God was won. Then she retired to a little cell at Viterbo and prepared in solitude for her end. She died in her eighteenth year. Not long after, she appeared in glory to Alexander the Fourth, and bade him translate her body. He found it as the vision had said, but fragrant and beautiful, as if still in life. Reflection Rose lived but seventeen years, saved the church's cause, and died a saint. 
we have lived perhaps much longer and yet with what result every minute something can be done for god let us be up and doing end of section sixty six section sixty seven of little pictorial lives of the saints by john gilmary shea this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. September 5th, St. Lawrence, Justinian. Lawrence, from a child, longed to be a saint, and when he was nineteen years of age, there was granted to him a vision of the eternal wisdom. All earthly things paled in his eyes before the ineffable beauty of this sight, and as it faded away, a void was left in his heart which none but God could fill refusing the offer of a brilliant marriage he fled secretly from his home at venice and joined the canons regular of st george one by one he crushed every natural instinct which could bar his union with his love when lawrence first entered religion a nobleman went to dissuade him from the folly of thus sacrificing every earthly prospect the young monk listened patiently in turn to his friend's affectionate appeal scorn and violent abuse calmly and kindly then replied he pointed out the shortness of life the uncertainty of earthly happiness and the incomparable superiority of the prize he sought to any his friend had named the nobleman could make no answer he felt in truth that lawrence was wise himself the fool he left the world became a fellow novice with the saint and his holy death bore every mark that he too had secured the treasures which never fail. As superior and as general, Lawrence enlarged and strengthened his order, and as bishop of his diocese, in spite of slander and insult, thoroughly reformed his see. His zeal led to his being appointed the first patriarch of Venice, but he remained ever in heart and soul an humble priest, thirsting for the sight of heaven at length the eternal vision began to dawn are you laying a bed of feathers for me he said not so my lord was stretched on a hard and painful tree laid upon the straw he exclaimed in rapture good jesus behold i come he died a d fourteen thirty five age seventy four reflection as st lawrence to vouchsafe you such a sense of the sufficiency of god that you too may fly to him and be at rest end of section sixty seven section sixty eight of little pictorial lives of the saints by john gilmary shea this librivox recording is in the public domain september six saint eleutherius abbot a wonderful simplicity and spirit of compunction were the distinguishing virtues of this holy man. He was chosen abbot of St. Mark's near Spoleto, and favored by God with the gift of miracles. A child who was possessed by the devil, being delivered by being educated in his monastery, the abbot said one day, Since the child is among the servants of God, the devil dares not approach him. These words seemed to savor of vanity and thereupon the devil again entered and tormented the child the abbot humbly confessed his fault and fasted and prayed with his whole community till the child was again freed from the tyranny of the fiend st gregory the great not being able to fast on easter eve on account of extreme weakness engaged the saint to go with him to the church of st andrews and put up his prayers to god for his health that he might join the faithful in that solemn practice of penance eleutherius prayed with many tears and the pope coming out of the church found his breast suddenly strengthened so that he was enabled to perform the fast as he desired saint eleutherius raised a dead man to life resigning his abbacy he died in saint andrew's monastery in rome about the year 585 reflection appear not to men to fast but to thy father who is in heaven and thy father who seeth in secret he will repay thee end of section sixty eight
Section 69 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. September 7th. St. Cloud, Confessor. St. Cloud is the first and most illustrious saint among the princes of the royal family of the first race in France. He was the son of Clotomir, King of Orleans, the eldest son of St. Clotilda, and was born in 522. He was scarce three years old when his father was killed in Burgundy, but his grandmother Clotilda brought up him and his two brothers at Paris, and loved them extremely. Their ambitious uncles divided the kingdom of Orleans between them, and stabbed with their own hands two of their nephews. Cloud, by a special providence, was saved from the massacre, and renouncing the world, devoted himself to the service of god in a monastic state after a time he put himself under the discipline of saint severinus a holy recluse who lived near paris from whose hands he received the monastic habit wishing to live unknown to the world he withdrew secretly into provence but his hermitage being made public he returned to paris and was received with the greatest joy imaginable at the earnest request of the people he was ordained priest by Eusebius, bishop of Paris, in 551, and served that church some time in the functions of the sacred ministry. He afterward retired to St. Cloud, two leagues below Paris, where he built a monastery. Here he assembled many pious men, who fled out of the world for fear of losing their souls in it. St. Cloud was regarded by them as their superior, and he animated them to all virtue both by word and example. He was indefatigable in instructing and exhorting the people of the neighboring country, and piously ended his days about the year 560. Reflection. Let us remember that the just shall live forevermore. They shall receive a kingdom of glory and a crown of beauty at the hand of the Lord. End of section 69. Section 70 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. September 8th. The Nativity of the Blessed Virgin. The birth of the Blessed Virgin Mary announced joy in the near approach of salvation to the lost world. Mary was brought forth in the world not like other children of Adam, infected with a loathsome contagion of sin, but pure, holy, beautiful and glorious, adorned with all the most precious graces which became her, who was chosen, to be the mother of God. She appeared indeed in the weak state of our mortality, but in the eyes of heaven she already transcended the highest seraph in purity, brightness, and the richest ornaments of grace. If we celebrate the birthdays of the great ones of this earth, how ought we to rejoice in that of the Virgin Mary? presenting to God the best homage of our praises and thanksgiving for the great mercies he has shown in her, and imploring her mediation with her son in our behalf. Christ will not reject the supplications of his mother, whom he was pleased to obey whilst on earth. Her love, care, and tenderness for him, the title and quality which she bears, the charity and graces with which she is adorned, and the crown of glory with which she is honored, must incline him readily to receive her recommendations and petitions. The festival on the Sunday within the octave of her nativity, of the holy name of Mary. The festival was appointed by Pope Innocent XI, that on it the faithful may be called upon in a particular manner to recommend to God, through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin, the necessities of his church, and to return him thanks for his gracious protection and numberless mercies. What gave occasion to the institution of this feast was a solemn thanksgiving for the relief of Vienna when it was besieged by the Turks in 1683. If we desired to deprecate the divine anger, justly provoked by our sins, with our prayers, we must join the tears of sincere compunction with a perfect conversion of our manners. The first grace we should always beg of God is that he will bring us to the disposition of condign penance. 
our supplications for the divine mercies and our thanksgivings for benefits received will only thus be rendered acceptable by no other means can we deserve the blessing of god or be recommended to it by the patronage of his holy mother to the invocation of jesus it is a pious and wholesome practice to join our application to the blessed virgin that through her intercession we may more easily and more abundantly obtain the effects of our petitions in this sense devout souls pronounce with great affection and confidence the holy names of jesus and mary End of section 70section 71 of little pictorial lives of the saints by john gilmary shea the sleeper box recording is in the public domain september ninth saint omer bishop saint omer was born toward the close of the sixth century in the territory of constance his parents who were noble and wealthy gave great attention to his education but above all strove to inspire him with a love for virtue upon the death of his mother he entered the monastery of luxin whither he persuaded his father to follow him after having sold his worldly goods and distributed the proceeds among the poor the father and son made the religious profession together the humility obedience mildness and devotion together with the admirable purity of manners which shone forth in every action of st omer distinguished him among his saintly brethren for he was soon called from his solitude to take charge of the government of the church in Terouan. The greater part of those living in his diocese were still pagans, and even the few Christians were, through a scarcity of priests, fallen into a sad corruption of manners. The great and difficult work of their conversion was reserved for St. Omer. The holy bishop applied himself to his task with such zeal that in a short time, his diocese became one of the most flourishing in france in his old age st omer became blind but that affliction did not lessen his pastoral concern for his flock he died in the odor of sanctity while on a pastoral visit to havre in six seventy blessed peter claver peter claver was a spanish jesuit in majorca he fell in with the holy lay brother alphonsus rodriguez who having already learned by revelation the saintly career of peter became his spiritual guide foretold to him the labors he would undergo in the indies and the throne he would gain in heaven ordained priest in new granada peter was sent to cartagena the great slave mart of the west indies and there he consecrated himself by vow to the salvation of those ignorant and miserable creatures for more than forty years he labored in this work he called himself the slave of the slaves he was their apostle father physician and friend he fed them nursed them with the utmost tenderness in their loathsome diseases often applying his own lips to their hideous sores his cloak which was the constant covering of the naked though soiled with their filthy ulcers sent forth a miraculous perfume his rest after his great labors was in nights of penance and prayer however tired he might be when news arrived of a fresh slave ship blessed peter immediately revived his eyes brightened and he was at once on board amongst the dear slaves bringing them comfort for body and soul a false charge of reiterating baptism for a while stopped his work he submitted without a murmur till the calumny was refuted and then god so blessed his toil that forty thousand negroes were baptized before he went to his reward in 1654 reflection when you see anyone standing in need of your assistance either for body or soul do not ask yourself why someone else did not help him but think to yourself that you have found a treasure end of section 71 section 72 of little pictorial lives of the saints by john gilmary shea this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. September 10th, St. Nicholas of Tolentino. Born in answer to the prayer of a holy mother, and vowed before his birth to the service of God, Nicholas never lost his baptismal innocence. 
his austerities were conspicuous even in the austere order the hermits of st augustine to which he belonged and to the remonstrances which were made by his superiors he only replied how can i be said to fast while every morning at the altar i receive my god he conceived an ardent charity for the holy souls so near and yet so far from their saviour and often after his mass it was revealed to him that the souls for whom he had offered the holy sacrifice had been admitted to the presence of god amidst his loving labours for god and man he was haunted by fear of his own sinfulness the heavens said he are not pure in the sight of him whom i serve how then shall i a sinful man stand before him as he pondered on these things mary the queen of all saints appeared before him fear not nicholas she said all is well with you my son bears you in his heart and i am your protection then his soul was at rest and he heard we are told the songs which the angels sing in the presence of their lord he died september tenth thirteen ten reflection would you die the death of the just there is only one way to secure the fulfilment of your wish live the life of the just for it is impossible that one who has been faithful to god in life should make a bad or an unhappy end end of section seventy two section seventy three of little pictorial lives of the saints by john gilmary shea this librivox recording is in the public domain september eleventh st paphnutius bishop the holy confessor paphnutius was an egyptian and after having spent several years in the desert under the direction of the great st anthony was made bishop in upper thebais he was one of those confessors who under the tyrant maximin dia lost their right eye and were afterwards sent to work in the mines peace being restored to the church paphnutius returned to his flock the arian heresy being broached in egypt he was one of the most zealous in defending the catholic faith and for his eminent sanctity in the glorious title of confessor or one who had confessed the faith before the persecutors and under torments was highly considered in the great council of nice constantine the great during the celebration of that synod sometimes conferred privately with him in his palace and never dismissed him without kissing respectfully the place which had once held the eye he had lost for the faith st paphnutius remained always in a close union with st athanasius and accompanied him to the council of tyre in three thirty five where they found much the greater part of that assembly to be professed arians seeing maximus bishop of jerusalem among them paphnutius took him by the hand led him out and told him he could not see that any who bore the same marks as he in defence of the faith should be seduced and imposed upon by persons who were resolved to oppress the most strenuous asserter of its fundamental article we have no particular account of the death of st paphnutius but his name stands in the roman martyology on the eleventh of september reflection if to fight for our country be glorious it is likewise great glory to follow the lord saith the wise man end of section seventy three section seventy four of little pictorial lives of the saints by john gilmary shea this librivox recording is in the public domain september twelfth st guy of anderlecht as a child guy had two loves the church and the poor the love of prayer growing more and more he left his poor home at brussels to seek greater poverty and closer union with god he arrived at laken near brussels and there showed such devotion before our lady's shrine that the priests besought him to stay and serve the church thenceforth his great joy was to be always in the church sweeping the floor and ceiling polishing the altars and cleansing the sacred vessels by day he still found time and means to befriend the poor so that his almsgiving became famous in all those parts a merchant of brussels hearing of the generosity of this poor sacristan came to lichen and offered him a share in his business guy could not bear to leave the church 
but the offer seemed providential and he at last closed with it their ship however was lost on the first voyage and on returning to lichen guy found his place filled the rest of his life was one long time penance for his inconstancy about the year ten thirty three finding his end at hand he returned to anderlecht in his own country as he died a light shone round him and a voice was heard proclaiming his eternal reward reflection jesus was only nine months in the womb of mary three hours on the cross three days in the sepulchre but he is always in the tabernacle does our reverence before him bear witness to this most blessed truth End of section 74section seventy five of little pictorial lives of the saints by john gilmary shea this LibriVox recording is in the public domain september thirteenth st eulogius patriarch of alexandria st eulogius was a syrian by birth and while young embraced the monastic state in that country the eutychian heresy had thrown the churches of syria and egypt into much confusion and a great part of the monks of syria were at that time become remarkable for their loose morals and errors against faith eulogius learned from the fall of others to stand more watchfully and firmly upon his guard and was not less distinguished by the innocence and sanctity of his manners than by the purity of his doctrines having by an enlarged pursuit of learning attained to a great variety of useful knowledge in the different branches of literature he set himself to the study of divinity and the sacred sources of that science which are the holy scriptures the tradition of the church as explained in its councils and the approved writings of its eminent pastors in the great dangers and necessities of the church he was drawn out of his solitude and made priest of antioch by the patriarch saint anastasius upon the death of john the patriarch of alexandria st eulogius was raised to that patriarchal dignity toward the close of the year five eighty three about two years after his promotion our saint was obliged to make a journey to constantinople in order to concert measures concerning certain affairs of his church he met at court st gregory the great and contracted with him a holy friendship so that from that time they seemed to be one heart and one soul among the letters of st gregory we have several extant which he wrote to our saint st eulogius composed many excellent works against different heresies and died in the year 606 reflection we admire the great actions and the glorious triumph of the saints yet it is not so much in these that their sanctity consisted as in the constant habitual heroic disposition of their souls there is no one who does not sometimes do good actions but he can never be called virtuous who does well only by humor or by fits and starts not by steady habits end of section seventy five section seventy six of little pictorial lives of the saints by john gilmary shea this librivox recording is in the public domain september fourteenth the exaltation of the holy cross of our lord jesus christ constantine was still wavering between christianity and idolatry when a luminous cross appeared to him in the heavens bearing the inscription in this sign shalt thou conquer he became a christian and triumphed over his enemies who were at the same time the enemies of the faith a few years later his saintly mother having found the cross on which our saviour suffered the feast of the exaltation was established in the church but it was only at a later period still namely after the emperor heraclius had achieved three great and wondrous victories over chosroes king of persia who had possessed himself of the holy and precious relic that this festival took a more generous extension and was invested with a higher character of solemnity the feast of the finding was thereupon instituted in memory of the discovery made by st helena and that of the exaltation was reserved to celebrate the triumphs of heraclius the greatest power of the catholic world was at that time centred in the empire of the east 
and was verging toward its ruin when God put forth his hand to save it. The re-establishment of the cross at Jerusalem was the sure pledge thereof. This great event occurred in 629. Reflection. Herein is found the accomplishment of the Savior's word. If I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all things to myself. End of section 76. Section 77 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. September 15th. St. Catherine of Genoa. Noble in birth, rich and exceedingly beautiful, Catherine had as a child rejected the solicitations of the world and begged her divine master for some share in his sufferings. At sixteen years of age she found herself promised in marriage to a young nobleman of dissolute habits, who treated her with such harshness that after five years, wearied out by his cruelty, she somewhat relaxed the strictness of her life and entered into the worldly society of Genoa. At length, enlightened by divine grace as to the danger of her state, she resolutely broke with the world and gave herself up to a life of rigorous penance and prayer. The charity with which she devoted herself to the service of the hospitals, undertaken the vilest of offices with joy, induced her husband to amend his evil ways, and he died penitent. Her heroic fortitude was sustained by the constant thought of the holy souls whose sufferings were revealed to her, and whose state she has described in a treatise full of heavenly wisdom. A long and grievous malady during the last years of her life only served to perfect her union with God, till worn out in body and purified in soul, she breathed her last on September 14, 1510. Reflection. The constant thought of purgatory will help us not only to escape its dreadful pains, but also to avoid the least imperfection which hinders our approach to God. End of section 77. Section 78 of Little Victoria Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. September 16th, St. Cyprian, Bishop, Martyr. Cyprian was an African of noble birth, but of evil life, a pagan and a teacher of rhetoric. In middle life he was converted to Christianity, and shortly after his baptism was ordained priest and made bishop of Carthage notwithstanding his resistance. When the persecution of Decius broke out, he fled from his Episcopal city that he might be the better able to minister to the wants of his flock, but returned on occasion of a pestilence. Later on he was banished, and saw in a vision his future martyrdom. Being recalled from exile, sentence of death was pronounced against him, which he received with the words, Thanks be to God. His great desire was to die whilst in the act of preaching the faith of Christ, and he had the consolation of being surrounded at his martyrdom by crowds of his faithful children. He was beheaded on the 14th of September, A.D. 258, and was buried with great solemnity. Even the pagans respected his memory. Reflection The duty of almsgiving is declared both by nature and revelation by nature, because it flows from the principle imprinted within us of doing to others as we would they should do to us, by revelation, in many special commands of Scripture, and in the precept of divine charity, which binds us to love God for his own sake, and our neighbor for the sake of God. End of section 78. Section 79 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. September 17th, St. Lambert, Bishop, Martyr. St. Lambert was a native of Maastricht. His father entrusted his education to the holy bishop, St. Theodard, and on that good man being assassinated, Lambert was chosen his successor. A revolution breaking out which overturned the kingdom of Austrasia 
our saint was banished from his see on account of his devotion to his sovereign he retired to the monastery of stavello and there obeyed the rule as strictly as the youngest novice could have done one instance will suffice to show with how perfect a sacrifice of himself he devoted his heart to serve god as he was rising one night in winter to his private devotions he happened to let fall his wooden sandal or slipper the abbot without asking who had caused the noise gave orders that the offender should go and pray before the cross which stood before the church door lambert without making any answer went out as he was barefoot and covered only with his hair shirt and in this condition he prayed kneeling before the cross where he was found some hours later at the sight of the holy bishop the abbot and the monks fell on the ground and asked his pardon god forgive you said he for thinking you stand in need of pardon for this action as for myself is it not in cold and nakedness that according to st paul i am to tame my flesh and to serve god while st lambert enjoyed the quiet of holy retirement he wept to see the greatest part of the churches of france laid waste in the meantime the political clouds began to break away and lambert was restored to his see but his zeal in suppressing the many and notorious disorders which existed in his diocese led to his assassination on the seventeenth of september seven o nine reflection how noble and heroic is this virtue of fortitude how necessary for every christian especially for a pastor of souls that neither worldly views nor fears may over in the least warp his integrity or blind his judgment End of section 79section eighty of little pictorial lives of the saints by john gilmary shea the sleepervox recording is in the public domain september eighteenth st thomas of villanova st thomas the glory of the spanish church in the sixteenth century was born a d fourteen eighty eight a thirst for science of the saints led him to enter the house of the austin friars at salamanca charles v listened to him as an oracle and appointed him archbishop of valencia on being led to his throne and church he pushed the silken cushions aside and with tears kissed the ground his visit was to the prison the sum with which the chapter presented him for his palace was devoted to the public hospital as a child he had given his meal to the poor and two-thirds of his episcopal revenues were now annually spent in alms he daily fed five hundred needy persons brought up by himself the orphans of the city and sheltered the neglected foundlings with a mother's care during his eleven years episcopate not one poor maiden was married without an alms from the saint spurred by his example the rich and the selfish became liberal and generous and when on the nativity of our lady a d fifteen fifty five st thomas came to die he was well nigh the only poor man in his see reflection answer me o sinner st thomas would say what can you purchase with your money better or more necessary than the redemption of your sins end of section eighty section eighty one of little pictorial lives of the saints by john gilmary shea this librivox recording is in the public domain september nineteenth st januarius martyr many centuries ago st januarius died for the faith in the persecution of diocletian and to this day god confirms the faith of his church and works a continual miracle through the blood which januarius shed for him the saint was bishop of beneventum and on one occasion he travelled to misenum in order to visit a deacon named sosius during this visit Januarius saw the head of Sosius, who was singing the gospel in the church, girt with flames, and took this for a sign that ere long Sosius would wear the crown of martyrdom. So it proved. Shortly after Sosius was arrested and thrown into prison, there St. Januarius visited and encouraged him, till the bishop also was arrested in turn. 
soon the number of the confessors were swollen by some of the neighboring clergy they were exposed to the wild beasts in the amphitheatre the beasts however did them no harm and at last the governor of campania ordered the saints to be beheaded little did the heathen governor think that he was the instrument in god's hand of ushering in the long succession of miracles which attest the faith of januarius the relics of st januarius rest in the cathedral of naples and it is there that the liquefaction of his blood occurs the blood is congealed in two glass vials but when it is brought near the martyr's head it melts and flows like the blood of a living man reflection thank god who has given you superabundant motives for your faith and pray for the spirit of the first christians the spirit which exults and rejoices in belief End of section 81section eighty two of little pictorial lives of the saints by john gilmary shea the sleeper rock recording is in the public domain september twentieth saints eustachius and companions martyrs eustachius called placidus before his conversion was a distinguished officer of the roman army under the emperor trajan one day whilst hunting a deer he suddenly perceived between the horns of the animal the image of our crucified saviour responsive to what he considered a voice from heaven he lost not a moment in becoming a christian in a short time he lost all his possessions and his position and his wife and children were taken from him reduced to the most abject poverty he took service with a rich landowner to tend his fields in the meantime the empire suffered greatly from the ravages of barbarians trajan sought out our saint and placed him in command of the troops sent against the enemy during this campaign he found his wife and children whom he despaired of ever seeing again returning home victorious he was received in triumph and loaded with honors but the emperor having commanded him to sacrifice to the false gods he refused infuriated at this trajan ordered eustasius with his wife and children to be exposed to two starved lions but instead of harming these faithful servants of god the beast merely frisked and frolicked about them the emperor grown more furious at this caused the martyrs to be shut up inside a brazen bull under which a fire was kindled and in this horrible manner they were roasted to death reflection it is not enough to encounter dangers with resolution we must with equal courage and constancy vanquish pleasure and the softer passions or we possess not the virtues of true fortitude. End of section 82 Section 83 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea The Sleeper Vox recording is in the public domain. September 21st, St. Matthew, Apostle One day, as our Lord was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw, sitting at the receipt of custom, Matthew the publican, whose business it was to collect the taxes from the people for the Roman masters. Jesus said to him, Follow me. And leaving all, Matthew arose and followed him. Now the publicans were abhorred by the Jews as enemies of their country, outcasts and notorious sinners, who enriched themselves by extortion and fraud. No Pharisee would sit with one at table. Our Saviour alone had compassion for them. So St. Matthew made a great feast, to which he invited Jesus and his disciples, with a number of these publicans, who henceforth began eagerly to listen to him. It was then in answer to the murmurs of the Pharisees that he said, They that are in health need not the physician. I have not come to call the just, but sinners, to penance. After the ascension, St. Matthew remained some years in Judea, and there wrote his gospel to teach his countrymen that jesus was their true lord and king foretold by the prophets st matthew afterward preached the faith far and wide and is said to have finished his course in parthia reflection obey all inspirations of our lord as promptly as st matthew who at a single word laid down says st bridget the heavy burden of the world to put on the light and sweet yoke of christ End of section eighty three
Section 84 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. September 22nd, The Theban Legion. The Theban Legion numbered more than 6,000 men. They marched from the east into Gaul and proved their loyalty at once to their emperor and to their god. They were encamped near the lake of Geneva under the emperor Maximian when they got orders to turn their swords against the Christian population, and refused to obey. In his fury, Maximian ordered them to be decimated. The order was executed once and again, and they endured this without a murmur or an effort to defend themselves. St. Morris, the chief captain in this legion of martyrs, encouraged the rest to persevere and follow their comrades to heaven. Know, O Emperor, he said, that we are your soldiers, but we are servants also of the true God. In all things lawful we will most readily obey, but we cannot stain our hands in this innocent blood. We have seen our comrades slain, and we rejoice at their honor. We have arms, but we resist not, for we had rather die without shame than live by sin. As the massacre began, these generous soldiers flung down their swords and placed their necks to the sword, and suffered themselves to be butchered in silence reflection thank god for every slight and injury you have to bear an injury borne in meekness and silence is a true victory it is the proof that we are good soldiers of jesus christ disciples of that heavenly wisdom which is first pure then peaceable end of section eighty four Section 85 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. September 23rd. St. Thecla, Virgin, Martyr. St. Thecla is one of the most ancient, as she is one of the most illustrious saints in the calendar of the Church. It was at Iconium that St. Paul met St. Thecla and kindled the love of virginity in her heart. She had been promised in marriage to a young man who was rich and generous, but at the apostle's words she died to the thought of earthly espousals. She forgot her beauty, she was deaf to her parents' threats, and at the first opportunity she fled from a luxurious home and followed St. Paul. The rage of her parents and of her intended spouse followed hard upon her, and the Roman power did its worst against the virgin whom Christ had chosen for his own. She was stripped and placed in the public theater, but her innocence shrouded her like a garment. Then the lions were let loose against her. They fell crouching at her feet and licked them as if in veneration. Even fire could not harm her. Torment after torment was inflicted upon her without effect, till at last her spouse spoke the word and called her to himself with the double crown of virginity and martyrdom on her head. Reflection it is purity in soul and body which will make you strong in pain, in temptation, and in the hour of death. Imitate the purity of this glorious virgin, and take her for your special patroness in your last agony. End of section 85 Section 86 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints by John Gilmary Shea this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. September 24th, The Blessed Virgin Mary of Mercy St. Peter of the noble family of Nolasco was born in Languedoc about 1189. At the age of 25, he took a vow of chastity and made over his vast estates to the church. Some time after, he conceived the idea of establishing an order for the redemption of captives. The divine will was soon manifested. The Blessed Virgin appeared on the same night to Peter, to Raymond of Penafort, his confessor, and to James, King of Aragon, his ward, and bade them prosecute without fear their holy designs. After great opposition, the order was solemnly established and approved by Gregory the Ninth, under the name of Our Lady of Mercy. By the grace of God and under the protection of his virgin mother, the order spread rapidly its growth being increased by the charity and piety of its members, who devoted themselves not only to collecting alms for the ransom of the Christians, but even gave themselves up to voluntary slavery to aid the good work. 
it is to return thanks to god and to the blessed virgin that a feast was instituted which was observed in the order of mary then in spain and france and at last extended to the whole church by innocent the twelfth and the twenty fourth of september named as the day on which it is to be observed reflection st peter nolasco and his knights were laymen not priests and yet they considered the salvation of their neighbor entrusted to them we can each of us by counsel by prayer but above all by holy example assist the salvation of our brethren and thus secure our own End of section 86section eighty seven of the little pictorial lives of the saints by john gilmary shea the sleeper box recording is in the public domain september twenty fifth st firman bishop martyr st finbar bishop st firman was a native of pamplone in navarre initiated in the christian faith by honestas a disciple of st saturninus of toulouse and consecrated bishop by St. Honoratus, successor to St. Saturninus, in order to preach the gospel in the remoter parts of Gaul. He preached the faith in the countries of Agen, Anjou, and Bouvais, and being arrived at Amiens, there chose his residence, and founded there a numerous church of faithful disciples. He received the crown of martyrdom in that city, whether under the prefect Rictius Varus, or in some other persecution from Decius in 250 to Diocletian in 303, is uncertain. St. Finbar, who lived in the 6th century, was a native of Connaught, and instituted a monastery or a school at Lac Air, in which such numbers of disciples flocked, as changed, as it were, a desert into a large city. This was the origin of the city of Cork, which was built chiefly upon stakes, and marshy little islands formed by the river Lea. The right name of our saint, under which he was baptized, was Lachan. The surname Finbar, or Bar the White, was afterward given him. He was Bishop of Cork seventeen years, and died in the midst of his friends at Cloyne, fifteen miles from Cork. His body was buried in his own cathedral at Cork, and his relics, some years after, were put in a silver shrine and kept there this great church bearing his name to this day st finbar's cave or hermitage was shown in a monastery which seems to have been begun by our saint and stood to the west of cork end of section eighty seven section eighty eight of little pictorial lives of the saints by john gilmary shea this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. September 26. St. Cyprian and Justina, Martyrs. The detestable superstition of St. Cyprian's idolatrous parents devoted him from his infancy to the devil, and he was brought up in all the impious mysteries of idolatry, astrology, and the black art. When Cyprian had learned all the extravagances of these schools of error and delusion, he hesitated at no crimes blasphemed christ and committed secret murders there lived at antioch a young christian lady called justina of high birth and great beauty a pagan nobleman fell deeply in love with her and finding her modesty inaccessible and her resolution invincible he applied to cyprian for assistance cyprian no less smitten with a lady tried every secret with which he was acquainted to conquer her resolution Justina, perceiving herself vigorously attacked, studied to arm herself by prayer, watchfulness, and mortification against all his artifices and the power of his spells. Cyprian, finding himself worsted by a superior power, began to consider the weakness of the infernal spirits and resolved to quit their service and become a Christian. Aglatius, who had been the first suitor to the Holy Virgin, was likewise converted and baptized. The persecution of Diocletian breaking out, Cyprian and Justina were seized and presented to the same judge. She was inhumanly scourged, and Cyprian was torn with iron hooks. 
after this they were both sent in chains to diocletian who commanded their heads to be struck off which sentence was executed reflection if the errors and disorders of st cyprian show the degeneracy of human nature corrupted by sin and enslaved to vice his conversion displays the power of grace and virtue to repair it let us beg of god to send us grace to resist temptation and to do his holy will in all things End of section 88section eighty nine of little pictorial lives of the saints by john gilmary shea this librivox recording is in the public domain september twenty seventh saints cosmos and damian martyrs saints cosmos and damian were brothers and born in arabia but studied the sciences in syria and became eminent for their skill in physic being christians and full of that holy temper of charity in which the spirit of our divine religion consists they practised their profession with great application and wonderful success but never took any fee they were loved and respected by the people on account of the good offices received from their charity and for their zeal for the christian faith which they took every opportunity to propagate when the persecution of diocletian began to rage was impossible for persons of so distinguished a character to lie concealed they were therefore apprehended by the order of lysias governor of cilicia and after various torments were bound hand and foot and thrown into the sea reflection we may sanctify our labor or industry if actuated by the motive of charity toward others even whilst we fulfill the obligation we owe to ourselves and our families of procuring an honest and necessary subsistence which of itself is no less noble a virtue if founded in motives equally pure and perfect end of section eighty nine section ninety of little pictorial lives of the saints by john gilmary shea the sleeper box recording is in the public domain september twenty eighth st wenceslaus martyr wenceslaus was the son of a christian duke of bohemia but his mother was a hard and cruel pagan through the care of his holy grandmother ludmila herself a martyr wenceslaus was educated in the true faith and imbibed a special devotion to the blessed sacrament on the death of his father his mother Dramomira, usurped the government and passed a series of persecuting laws in the interests of the faith wenceslas claimed and obtained through the support of the people a large portion of the country as his own kingdom his mother secured the apostasy and alliance of her second son boleslas who became henceforth her ally against the christians wenceslas meanwhile ruled as a brave and pious king provided for all the needs of his people and when his kingdom was attacked overcame in single combat by the sign of the cross the leader of an evading army in the service of god he was most constant and planted with his own hands the wheat and grapes for the holy mass at which he never failed daily to assist his piety was the occasion of his death once after a banquet at his brother's palace to which he had been treacherously invited he went as was his wont at night to pray before the tabernacle there at midnight on the feast of the angels a d nine thirty eight he received his crown of martyrdom his brother dealing him the death blow reflection st wenceslaus teaches us that the safest place to meet the trials of life or to prepare for the stroke of death is before jesus and the blessed sacrament end of section ninety section ninety one of little pictorial lives of the saints by john gilmary shea this librivox recording is in the public domain september twenty ninth st michael archangel michael or who is like to god such was the cry of the great archangel when he smote the rebel lucifer in the conflict of the heavenly hosts and from that hour he has been known as michael the captain of the armies of god 
the type of divine fortitude the champion of every faithful soul in strife with the powers of evil thus he appears in holy scripture as the guardian of the children of israel their comfort and protector in times of sorrow or conflict he it is who prepares for the return from the persian captivity who leads the valiant maccabees to victory and who rescues the body of moses from the envious grasp of the evil one and since christ's coming the church has ever venerated saint michael as her special patron and protector she invokes him by name in her confession of sins summons him to the side of her children in the agony of death and chooses him as their escort from the chastening flames of purgatory to the realms of holy light lastly when antichrist shall set up his kingdom on earth it is michael who will unfurl once more the standard of the cross sound the last trumpet and binding together the false prophet and the beast hurl them for all eternity into the burning pool reflection whenever says saint bernard any grievous temptation or vehement sorrow oppresses thee invoke thy guardian thy leader cry out to him and say lord save us lest we perish End of section 91section 92 of little pictorial lives of the saints by john gilmary shea this librivox recording is in the public domain september thirtieth saint jerome doctor saint jerome born in dalmatia a d 329 was sent to school at rome his boyhood was not free from fault his thirst for knowledge was excessive and his love of books a passion he had studied under the best masters visited foreign cities and devoted himself to the pursuit of science but christ had need of a strong will and active intellect for the service of his church st jerome felt and obeyed the call made a vow of celibacy fled from rome to the wild syrian desert and there for four years learnt in solitude penance and prayer a new lesson of divine wisdom this was his novitiate the pope soon summoned him to rome and there put under the now famous hebrew scholar the task of revising the latin bible which was to be his noblest work retiring thence to his beloved bethlehem the eloquent hermit poured forth from his solitary cell for thirty years a stream of luminous writings upon the christian world reflection to know says saint basil how to submit thyself with thy whole soul is to know how to imitate christ End of section 92. End of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, July through September, by John Gilmary Shea.